Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the second DART International Conference. It's a virtual conference. I'm glad to see everybody here. Uh, let's start right away with the president's address by our beloved founder and president, Anand Sir. Sir, good morning. Uh, and are you okay? You're not. I'm just asking you to unmute yourself. Yeah, yeah, it's unmute. Yes, sir. Yeah, you can hear me. Yes, sir. Please go. Ahead. Ah, thanks, buddy. Good morning, Suresh. He's yeah. muted. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, are there other people on the uh, buddy? Yes, sir. Are there other we, people? We have fifty-six participants right now, sir. Who are who are so? Uh, good what morning, everyone. Uh, uh, welcome to this uh, virtual conference. Wonderful to have you guys here. Uh, it's it's great that we are able to do this uh, under these circumstances. But we thought it would be good to uh, you know have a, uh, have a conduct a conference and let everybody know where that is, where what we are doing, where we have reached. And uh, what's our future plans? Hopefully, I hope Bertie will not reveal all the plans. Yeah, because we need uh, to keep some things under wraps. But the thing is that uh, I think the last conference, couple of years have passed, and since then we've been uh, we've been making significant progress. Uh, we started with Karan's uh, case study, which has led to uh, getting our clinical trial approvals. Uh, we've got the support of uh, the finest pediatric neurologists and other doctors across India. Uh, hospitals are keen to start this clinical trial. And uh, we set up our own uh, in-house manufacturing facility, uh, which has now been uh, certified by drug controller. So all in all, things are moving well. It's a baby step which we started with in the beginning, I feel that we have made some significant progress. Thanks to all the uh, all the people working in DART and the support from all the other parents. Um, it's uh, uh, Across the day, you, you, you'll hear many people speak about uh, what's happening in the world of Duchenne in India and around the world, uh, what they are expecting from people uh, uh, like us and other researchers, uh, how the government will be able to uh, support and you know uh, take us forward, uh, where we are uh, lacking behind, uh, what are the roadblocks, uh, what do we need, uh, and after what do we need comes uh, very simple. It's we need support, money. We need technology, money. Uh, we need uh, support, money. So it just keeps boiling down to money. And uh, we've, we've been able to reach uh, here as of now. And uh, I'm, I'm sure that uh, uh, with all the support, we'll, we'll be moving forward. A good thing now is that uh, Suresh will be happy to know that uh, we are in the process. I think Bertie will be able to update you uh, and Vishnu that we, we are setting up uh, 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 a virtual physiotherapy center where we can actually uh, uh, assist parents and uh, uh, patients who physically cannot come to DART. And through video conferencing, we can uh, you know, take, uh, uh, give them the support, uh, support that they are uh, looking for. Uh, you can register online. Uh, the payment gateway is open now. Uh, so new new things are happening, and uh, 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 I'll be around for the rest of the day, and uh, wish everybody uh, happy Dushan Awareness Day. Uh, today is September seventh. So, buddy, all yours. Have a good one. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. So, we have been very. Uh, one of the things about the pandemic is that it has made us all realize how important the internet is. So one of the things that we discovered is Zoom. And thanks to Zoom, we've been using this. Uh, and the first person we'll be hearing from is not live, 
but he's still on Zoom and talking to us is Professor Steve Wilton. So he has a small video for us, uh, and he also will be in the process. He'll also be launching uh, the second edition of Darshan's Dart newsletter. So let me just uh, share what Professor Steve Wilton has to say. I assume this is recording. Um, greetings from Western Australia uh, to the Anand, uh, the, the Dartian team, and the rest of the colleagues at uh, Bangalore. I'm afraid the current COVID situation has really made um, conferences dif uh, difficult and making these virtual or online uh, conferences much more common. Actually, I think this is about my fourth online conference this year. Um, and while it's useful in sort of uh, disseminating information, um, I really miss the personal contact, the face-to-face the -face and catching up with people. Now, Anand's asked me for a, a few comments on the, the global situation regarding therapies for Duchenne. And um, again, this is, it's, I suppose it's a, a promising time in that um, there's some, some therapies are really showing a great deal of promise. And the important thing is that this is going to have spin-offs to other conditions, other forms of muscular dystrophy. Now, gene therapy, um, some of the gene therapy trials are being very, are very, very promising. Um, the ones in the States, um, uh, some are going really well. Others uh, are raising safety concerns. So the importance of the, the actual vector being used is, is crucial. Um, at the low doses, they're all safe, um, but at the higher doses, there have been deaths. Uh, and so there's got to be a great deal of caution in, in how this is working. Um, the other thing, I suppose, the complexity of muscle biology, simple cell division and, and uh, muscle growth is still being unraveled. And this is starting to account for why the, the, the cell therapies from 20, 25 years ago just failed in humans. They worked in mice, but they failed terribly in humans. And it's not as simple as just doing a cell transplant and hoping that they're going to survive and proliferate. So as more information uh, comes out, we've got a better chance of making a difference there. The excellent skipping work, as uh, most people will be aware, is, is still progressing really well. And there are now three compounds that have been given uh, accelerated approval by the FDA. So more information is needed. That the FDA want to see uh, more data from patients. But this is looking really promising. And in the, in the, I was going to say in the background, at the same time, many other approaches are being evaluated. And these are using small molecules or other drugs or repurposing drugs that will reduce inflammation, they'll stop fibrosis, they'll improve cell repair. Um, and really, it's going to be a combination of all these treatments that are going to make um, an effective therapy. I mean, for example, Duchenne, uh, Exxon Skipping and Duchenne, you're not curing the disease, you can't cure the disease, you can reduce the severity. So a lot of the supplemental treatments to augment the treatment uh, could be very, very substantial. Now, all these approaches started with academic research um, and collaboration. I mean people at a conference. And um, I recall it was a, a conference in the southwest of Western Australia down around Margaret River. And I was, this is going back quite a number of years. So I was giving a talk about excellent skipping. And I was just chatting with this guy beforehand. And he said, look, why are you wasting your time with um, this excellent skipping and anti-sense work? Everyone knows anti-sense doesn't work. Now, this is a person that involved in the early anti-sense um, studies, different targets, different genes, different mechanisms. And he said, it, it, it doesn't work. It, it, it's rubbish. And I said, well, let's have a listen to a talk look at the data and then we'll have a chat afterwards. And if you can show strong, compelling data, then it's irrefutable. 
And the, the, the data has to be robust. So you do an experiment in one lab and then collaborate with another group and have it um, replicated there. And then you've all of a sudden, it's not just a flash in the pan. It's not just one lab can do it, but it can't be repeated anywhere else. So that sort of science just doesn't work anymore. Um, so in summary, I suppose, uh, I'm really disappointed I can't be there. And, and this, this is a virtual conference. Uh, Bangalore is such a wonderful place. And, uh, uh, and I'm hoping that it's only going to be a year or so before the COVID treatments become available and we can start to travel again. So congratulations to Anand and his team uh, for the, the, the DART initiative. You know, their enthusiasm and drive is really infectious. It's been, it's been involved with uh, uh, DART for uh, many years now. And uh, again, it's the collaboration and working um, across different sites of the world is a, is a real privilege. So it's my pleasure to launch the second edition of the Dartians, the quarterly newspaper from Dart to update the global community about their life-changing research. So congratulations on a, um, the, the virtual conference and uh, I hope you have a great time. Cheers for now. Bye. That, that was Professor Steve Wilton from Murdoch University, Western Australia. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you so much. And now, like he said, it is our pleasure and honor to release the second edition of Dashian's newsletter. Uh, I would request the Chief Scientific Officer of DART, uh, Dr. Arun Shastri, to paste the link in the chat below. Uh, it'll have, it'll take you directly to the newsletter. Or uh, if you go to www.dartindia.in, uh, you can see the newsletter there. Uh, and please feel free to also download it onto your, onto your phone and on WhatsApp, spread it with friends and family, and also to share the link with others. And this also gives me a chance to ask Dr. Arun Shastri to come, uh, to come on screen and talk to us about his uh, role and the role of DART in uh, pioneering research and therapy in India. Dr. Arun Shastri, the floor is yours. Good morning, everyone. I am Arun. Uh, I am the Chief Scientific Officer of DART. I'll be uh, presenting the data of what we have done till now for the last eight years and which has led to the approval of clinical trials to be conducted in India for the first time for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So we have evaluated the therapeutic evaluation of antisense oligonucleotide based exon skipping for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. As we know, the dystrophin gene consists of 17 and exons and basically it affects boys. Uh, and uh, by the age of 12, they get into the wheelchair and there are different kinds of mutations from deletions, duplications, and other point mutations which need a personalized therapy. And we focus on something called exon skipping. And the chemistry which we use is 2 prime methoxy phosphothiate antisense oligonucleotide, which uses a oligonucleotide to cause exon skipping for a patient who suffers from Duchenne muscular dystrophy. As we all know that exon skipping is the only approved therapy till now and US FDA has got approval for three different exons now, exon 45, 51 and 53. That's what motivated us also to go through this path. The main uh, data which I'm presenting is, uh, which we had done on a single patient study who was having a frame shift mutation in exon 51 and he required skipping of exon 51 and 52. So the idea was to evaluate this oligonucleotide through an intravenous injection for 52 weeks to study the safety and efficacy of this exon skipping therapy. This was a study which was uh, funded by Indian Council for Medical Research. Uh, we are extremely indebted to ICMR for this. It was an open label study with a male subject uh, with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So the subject received uh, 2.5 mg per kg of intravenous dosage for 52 weeks continuously. The main uh, objective was to study the clinical safety and also the efficacy and also to observe whether there were any side effects or severe adverse events observed during the study. So these are the significant results we have seen that there was a 50% reduction seen in the serum 
CPK levels, which is considered as a biomarker for muscle injury and also degeneration. All the blood parameters and levels were maintained during this treatment, so there were no uh, anomaly observed in liver levels as well. Uh, vitamin D levels were significantly improved. The lung function was also retained during this 52 weeks. There was also uh, the heart function was found to be normal during the treatment. And the main thing which we observed was the muscle function or the muscle strength, which was evaluated through different tests like North Star ambulatory levels and also manual myometry using a handheld dynamometer. We saw that there was considerable amount of muscle strength improvement in the biceps, quadriceps, and also significant improvement in the muscle force. So the summary of the study was that this therapy is safe. Although this has been tried worldwide on more than 800 children and currently it's approved. In India, this was the first study which led to us to submit this application to the Indian FDA, that is DCGI for clinical trial approval. And I'm very happy to tell you that we got the approval. Although the cost of this drug, which comes in the US is around $300,000 per year. That is around two crores Indian rupees. We at DART, which is funded and founded by parents, we have made it into an affordable price of 20 lakhs per year per child. Now, I know that this is still expensive, but we request the support from government to make it even more affordable so that it can go to every DMD child. Now, we are ready for clinical trials. There are going to be announcement made for this. There are nine clinical trials across India who will be doing these trials and soon we will be releasing the information. And I'm very thankful to my team from DART who have supported us in developing this and the family and the parents who have funded this. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shastri. Uh, we are indeed honored and privileged to be part of this. Uh, it has been an amazing journey when we started to get this far. And I know that we have a long way to go. Uh, we are currently waiting for Dr. Soumya Swaminathan, the chief scientist at the World Health Organization. Uh, she is in Geneva. So uh, we are also taking into account the time difference because this is an international conference. And uh, if I may, may I ask the next speaker, uh, Dr. Meenakshi Bhatt from the Center for Human Genetics uh, to please come forward. And ma'am, uh, the floor is yours. Let me just, yes. So Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. And thank you very much, DART team, for having me over here. Uh, it's a pleasure to be part of this uh, uh, international conference. So if somebody can put on my slides, I thought I'd start off by speaking, Bertie. Yes, ma I can do that. Thank you so much. So my role uh, was to speak about uh, genetic counseling and rare genetic disorders. I think uh, from even from the first couple of talks, you would have seen that it's extremely difficult to make sense of what is happening in this high scientific levels. And when it comes to families, to translate that into uh, information that everybody understands. And that's the purpose of genetic counseling because each of these disorders that we deal with are hugely rare. And uh, to, for the individual themselves to know what happened to them, uh, for the family to know how to go about with it, and how exactly uh, do we deal with it. So can you put on the next slide, uh, Bertie? Yes. I don't think it's in, sorry. Are you struggling? Uh, one second, ma'am. It, it's not going full screen, I'm just doing it again. Okay. Is it full screen now? No. <laughs> ah, okay, it is full screen on my side. One second, I'm just stopping sharing and doing this again. Okay. Okay. It's, um, okay, ma'am. I'll just go this way. Okay, just go to the next slide. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. So uh, I thought I'd start off with something that's hugely rare anyway, you know, since this was uh, 
not necessarily only about DMD. So this was a patient of mine from many years ago. He calls himself the world's smallest bodybuilder. He has his own website. At, and you can see that he was absolutely tiny from whichever angle you looked at him as an adult. What did he come to ask? Of course, his obvious question was, can I become full size, normal sized, which is very difficult as an adult. But the second question that he asked was, what do I have? And also, how do I see life ahead? Because he was in his early 20s. And answering these questions is actually uh, part of genetic counseling. What we really did was we did genetic testing. We found the cause of his problems, which was a gene, uh, which is an autosomal recessive disorder called pericentrin. And he has what is in short called MOPD2. Because we knew what he had, we knew what it could cause. And when we looked at the figure on the right side shows you something that is called Moya Moya disease. This is an alteration in the brain, which can lead to premature strokes because we knew that this was something that could happen, we looked for it. And we could stop, we could uh, uh, actually embolize his Moya Moya condition. And therefore, he still continues to be the world's uh, smallest bodybuilder. So I think counseling, making the families understand what they have, and then dealing with it leads to a lot of uh, advantages. And especially if the family themselves can understand it. Can we go to the next slide? So what is genetic counseling? So it is the process of communicating with the affected individual or with the at-risk family. So sometimes the family will come themselves instead of uh, just the individual. And that is the unique thing about genetic disorders. If we look at the wider uh, landscape of the family. So the diagnosis of the genetic condition in the family is explained to them, the inheritance pattern, the prognosis, what happens next, lifespan, development, schooling, marriage in our country is something that is very important to be discussed, offspring risks, uh, treatment, if there is any that is uh, to be discussed, and everybody needs to understand what it means. So if you speak in scientific language, it may not be of use to uh, others. So the risk of other family members inheriting the same disorder comes later once people have digested this and they want to know whether their next child or other brothers and sisters' children will have it. And of course, what you can do about it from early diagnosis to diagnosis in pregnancy, early treatment, anything else that can be supportive. And the process of communicating all this to the family is what we call genetic counseling. Can we go to the next slide? So I've shown you here something that is very dear to me, a new India 500 rupee note. And this circle there is the number of languages in which it's written 500 rupees. So at least 15 official languages in alphabetical order. And this is the type of language uh, problems that we have and we need to communicate with patients. So in an average day, you'll have five or six different language speaking families that come for consultation. And it becomes difficult if you do not know all the languages. So we have gathered a team around us that can speak scientifically and in lay language to explain scientific concepts. And uh, this is how it's done. You need to speak the language known to the family. You need to have time. We usually give long appointments. You can't just shoo away a family in 10 minutes and say, that's done. I've got my next patient waiting. You have to have lots of patience. In case they don't understand, you need to spend some time re-explaining these things. We need to know that many people do not know what a chromosome or a gene is. It's a very theoretical concept to them. In these cases, we try and use figures, pictures, everyday examples to explain what it's all about. And very, very importantly, we do not try to tell them what is the right way forward. You tell them all the options available to the family and let them decide what's best for their family context. Sometimes families will ask you, but you tell me what I should do. And I think that's a temptation most genetic counselors should avoid doing uh, because what's right for one person may not be right for the other person. And we usually follow up all consultations with a letter to the family summarizing what you have said. This helps when you forget about all those technical words that you've used and when the family needs to re-communicate with other people. Can we go to the next slide? So coming to DMD itself, you know, all of us know that DMD is a progressive disorder. It affects muscle groups. It affects the larger upper muscle groups and therefore it causes gait problems at the earliest. 
and it's due to a faulty gene on X chromosome. And if we look at the chromosome makeup of men and women, uh, women have two X chromosomes, so a 46XX, and a man has a 46XY. Having a single X is the issue why men uh, have signs and symptoms of this from very early on. But there are always these invisible questions that come up and this should be addressed when you're counseling. Is the mother always a carrier? This is a question most mothers suffer from either guilt or questions or the family asks these questions. And of course, there are practical issues when you're planning to have uh, future babies. Should unaffected sisters of DMD be tested? Uh, if a mother is negative, no, the sisters should not be tested. Can women also be affected? These are called manifesting carriers. And yes, occasionally, very rarely, you might have women who show symptoms of some of the things that children or boys with DMD may have. Can a baby be affected even if the mother is not a carrier? This is sometimes as a result of gonadal mosaicism, and we'll talk about it a little bit later. Can we go to the next slide? So the typical pedigree of an X-linked recessive disorder like DMD, uh, we start off with the affected boy, the shaded black uh, uh, squares are the affected boys, and the affected gene or the mutated gene is on an X chromosome. For boys who do not have a balancing uh, gene on the other chromosome because it's a Y, uh, the single affected gene may cause problems. Uh, and these are the problems that manifest from very early childhood. What is the chance that a mother is a carrier if you test backwards? I think in a third of cases, the mothers may carry the mutated gene themselves and are carriers. The majority of mothers are completely unaffected because they have the other X chromosome, which may be completely normal. In about 70% uh, of cases, if the mother is not a carrier, you have uh, still a chance of having another affected child. So whether the mother is a carrier or not a carrier, it's important for that mother to have prenatal diagnosis if she so wishes to know whether her next child is likely to have this condition or not. The reason why there is a high chance of this passing on to the next child is because of something called germline or gonadal mosaicism. So people who are tested are usually tested in a blood sample, but occasionally if the blood does not have the mutated gene, but it's present in the gonads, in this case in the ovaries, then you can have another recurrence within the same family. It's important to do, know this because in DMD, all mothers should be offered the chance of having prenatal diagnosis. Can we go to the next slide? So in an extended family tree, where you may have more than one person that's affected, and in this case, it's the shaded males, they're usually connected by females who are mothers and sisters and aunts. So the question when you look at a family tree, and it's very important to take a detailed family tree is, is this Duchenne muscular dystrophy, or is this a milder form of Becker muscular dystrophy? The age of onset of first symptom will be one clue towards what this is. Mutation studies help also. The second thing is, what is the chance that these two arrows pointing at two girls who are sisters of affected patients, what is the chance of them being carriers? And what is the chance of them being uh, having affected children in the future? So it's very important that counseling covers all of these issues and does not focus only on the affected individual. Can we go to the next slide? So when we do genetic testing, it is the gold standard of knowing whether there is uh, a Duchenne muscular dystrophy or not, and the type of mutation that the affected child has. Why is it important? Because what Dr. Uh, Shastri uh, said in the beginning, that at the moment there are therapies that are targeted towards specific mutations, and the antisense oligonucleotide mediated uh, thing usually works on the deletions and duplications to some extent. Whereas if you have a nonsense mutation or a point mutation, you might uh, have a better chance of being treated with something called atelurin. And more therapies are coming along as we speak, but they are very specific to the type of mutations that you see. This also needs to be communicated to families because they think that if one family has been eligible for treatment, everybody comes under the same umbrella and that's not true. Can we go to the next slide? What happens if you are looking at future pregnancies? 
the whole process of prenatal diagnosis not only needs to be explained to families, but it also needs to be offered to families when they do come to you again, because this is something they may wish to know so that they are prepared for what they require to do with the future baby. So prenatal diagnosis usually involves doing CVS testing or chorion villus sampling. What it does is to take a direct sample from the developing placenta and then send that sample for the mutation testing, especially for the familial mutation testing that you see in the particular family. So this would give you a definitive answer and the process of CVS, the time duration that it would take the actual uh, appointments that you would keep around for it, where it's done, how it's done, and giving the results when they're ready is all part of genetic counseling. Can we go to the next slide? So in summary, just to give you a whole gist of what I've spoken about, genetic uh, counseling helps for the family or the affected individual to understand the features of a rare disease and its inheritance pattern and it somehow is closure to a family when they know that there is an answer to why it's happened. Have the correct genetic test because once you know after taking a family history and checking out the clinical features, then you can suggest the right type of test. And this helps confirm the diagnosis and rather than say that it may be this or it may be that. And take the right decisions about what treatment to have and when is the right stage to start that treatment. Know the risk to future pregnancies and plan the right test for the diagnosis. Also test other healthy family members who might be at risk of having children or other affected uh, individuals and contact and meet other families with a similar uh, condition. And this is hugely important in rare diseases. And I think to that effect, that has been very instrumental in coming together with other families and medical people. And I'll end with my last slide which was a similar meeting that we had and some happy moments that we had together with the Dart family. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Uh, it, was, it was quite nice to see that picture because it reminded of the times when we could actually go and meet people. Uh, but it has been indeed a pleasure and an honor working with CHG. Uh, we are now extremely honored and privileged to have Dr. Soumya Sornadhan, the chief scientist uh, at the World Health Organization with us. Uh, I would request her to come and uh, join us on the floor. Ma'am. Good morning, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Good morning. Good morning to all of you and very nice to see you though from a distance remotely. Um, good morning to the entire uh, DART family and, and all those friends and well-wishers who have come together to, to mark this, uh, uh, this day today. I have been part of the DART journey now for the last, uh, I don't know, maybe five years or so when I first uh, came to know about Mr. Anand and um, Karan and, and all the other children in that group and the wonderful efforts that uh, were being made to actually find a solution for a problem that uh, we all know is, is a very difficult and a very tragic disease like many of the other rare diseases. I'm a pediatrician by training and I uh, have seen many children with different rare diseases because I trained at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, which was the last stop or the stop of last resort for parents who could not find a solution anywhere. And so our wards would always have a few children with um, some, of course, not so rare diseases that were much more common, thalassemia, sickle cell, and so on. But others, um, like the lipopolysaccharidosis and other rare uh, neurological syndromes and of course the muscular dystrophies. And um, as a doctor, it, you always felt very helpless and um, very um, sad always, you know, that you could not offer a, a solution really, a long lasting solution for most of these uh, cases, uh, at least most of the genetic disorders. This was uh, in the early 80s when um, uh, even the etiology of many of these was still being understood and discovered. And certainly we didn't have the kind of detailed genetic um, sequencing 
capacities that we have today. So it's very encouraging and heartening to see the progress being made on several of these diseases, both uh, through the use of these genetic sequencing technologies, in fact, mainly through the use, because then unless one understands the exact uh, disorder and the exact pathophysiology, which, which gene, which protein is affected, then you can, of course, begin to try and correct that through the use of various genetic therapies. So when I heard about the efforts of DART, it was, uh, it was something very unique uh, where parents actually go about um, trying to solve a problem uh, through science, not through you know, the usual means, of course, is that parent groups form very effective advocacy groups. And there are many, many diseases in which these parent groups have been really, really effective and have been able to bring about change and have been able to, to even uh, change policy, change laws uh, in, in respective governments. But here there's a group that's actually trying to find a scientific solution, something normally that a high-tech research institute would be doing. But here was a group of parents who were doing it just through sheer, not just through sheer willpower, but through a very thought through and a very scientific approach. Um, so I really was impressed and uh, since then I've been following the journey uh, of this group and I must say I'm extremely pleased to see the progress made and where they are now. And of course in science you cannot predict that everything you try is going to work 100%. But it is through these kind of incremental advances that one can progress and that eventually there will be a cure. I'm, I'm very confident that there will be a cure, not just for Duchenne's, but for many other rare diseases. The fact is that just because it affects a small or relatively small number of people, it doesn't make it irrelevant or less important than diseases that affect millions, at least for those who are affected and people around them. But it is, you know, just happens that these diseases get less attention, less resources than more common diseases. Now, we estimate that there may be somewhere between 5,000 to 8,000 different conditions. Most rare diseases are genetic, but not all. You can have rare diseases also, which are not um, genetic. Now, of course, the first problem or the challenge is diagnosis because rare diseases present fundamentally different diagnostic challenges and, and therefore you need innovative methods, particularly when you're living in a lower income country um, where facilities for genetic testing are not available uh, widely, where doctors even may not be really uh, trained to pick up some of these early signs and, and make the right kind of referrals. And early diagnosis is important in most of these conditions if we are to make a significant uh, difference. We have to intervene early and particularly there are some conditions where you can actually make simple dietary changes and have major impacts on the child's, um, on the outcomes. And so early detection, early diagnosis is very important. But you know, the small number of patients, the logistics involved in reaching these widely dispersed patients, because they are rare, they are obviously, you, no doctor will ever see a large number of cases. And so that's also part of the challenge that it's hard for them to know what they're dealing with, the lack of validated biomarkers or surrogate endpoints, the lack of clinical expertise and expert centers. These are all the barriers uh, which can be quite significant in many, many um, countries. In fact, I remember even a disease like sickle cell anemia, which is not that rare, the, in, in large parts of uh, Africa, the developing world, it is uh, not easy for a child to even get a diagnosis established of sickle cell anemia, let alone access treatments, simple treatments like hydroxyurea, which can uh, and improve the quality of life, uh, let alone gene therapies. So this kind of fragmented disease knowledge where because conditions are rare, there isn't any one center in the country or in the world which will have that accumulated experience this makes it very um, critical 
that investments in research must go hand in hand with investments in dedicated infrastructure and international networks such as biobanks, registries and networks of expertise and collaboration can really uh, help us. And we see, I have seen that in Europe, for example, uh, this kind of networking between countries on rare diseases, establishing a joint registry, establishing one in the region, which can do the genetic sequencing and um, has actually led them to develop um, uh, databases and, and find um, the genes responsible for some of these rare diseases, which you cannot do if you're dealing with one or two or three uh, cases in a country. Therefore, in a large country like India, of course, registries um, across the country would help, but in smaller countries, what you need is networking between countries and regional uh, registries and uh, centers where the genetic testing can be done. Now, how does WHO really uh, come into this? We do not have a big group of people that work on uh, rare diseases, uh, unfortunately, but we are very committed because of the, uh, of, the, of the mandate of WHO and the vision to leave no one behind. It is really important for us that we continue to advocate for and continue to, to uh, um, update the knowledge on rare diseases. One of the things that we uh, do, of course, is to produce guidelines. Uh, and this is our main function, critical part of our normative function. And this can really strengthen the work of these expert networks and help to take this information that's gathered and reach it to the policymakers, the healthcare providers, as well as patients and families. Um, so it's also important for us to assess the methods of uh, assessing evidence for the small patient populations that we're talking about. So normally, you know, our Normative guidance is based on, on big uh, meta-analyses, systematic reviews, evidence gathering, and the guidelines are based on the, both the quantity and the quality of evidence. But in this case, again, you, you have to make guidelines based on uh, smaller numbers. We, of course, need public funding for research into rare diseases uh, and clinical trials and agencies like the ICMR and the DBT and the Department of Science and Technology in India uh, are the ones would be investing into this, but we also need pharma companies and private public partnerships because ultimately it is the pharma companies that will be able to scale up any solutions that may be found in smaller labs or in academic um, institutes. Now, one of WHO's uh, global roles in uh, rare diseases is to expand the classification system so that reliable epidemiological data can be um, generated. So as you know, we have the International Classification of Disease, the ICD, and last year the ICD-11 was released. And the ICD actually is an international standard for how diseases must be classified. And the, the idea is that a particular um, disease is classified in the same way across the world, it makes it much easier then for any kind of analysis, whether you're looking at the prevalence of the disease, whether you're looking at the clinical profile, or whether you're looking at outcomes, unless the name of the disease and, and the way it is recorded in the medical um, records um, is, is standardized, you cannot compare. And so the ICD-11 is a very much expanded um, form of this classification. It's added on many new things. And um, in fact, we do dis have discussions with uh, the red, rare red, uh, disease uh, networks with us when they raise issues about how these diseases should be classified. And this is something that is constantly updated and changing. So we also are involved in facilitating the translation of research into products uh, development by developing target product profiles, by putting out you know, the, the information that, that's available and for promoting research. Uh, because WHO is not a, a funder of research, but what we can do is to promote, to facilitate, to advocate for and to help prioritize research. We sit with the research funders. We are invited to sit with the uh, international group of research funders as an observer into their meetings and we can provide their inputs 
into where we think they could be focusing. These are again public sector research funders, government funders, but uh, we also deal with uh, a lot of the private sector who's into product development. They come to us for advice for, for the kind of products, what we call target product profiles, and we help them in the end to end, right from thinking about what kind of product is, would be most useful all the way to thinking about how does it get into policy and how does it get into, into practice. Of course, we are committed to the achievement of the SDG and uh, the vision of the SDGs is a world where no one is left behind. And this includes people with rare diseases. So our top priority currently, uh, of course, today we are living in, in this uh, pandemic world where the world is got focused on, on coronavirus and uh, because it has changed everybody's lives. And so for the foreseeable future, we can see that most of the world's attention is going to be on trying to get out of this pandemic, uh, which has caused not only uh, an impact on a terrible impact on economies, livelihoods, but lives are being lost every day. Um, and, and therefore the kind of scientific efforts we've seen that have gone into solving this problem have really been unprecedented. Sitting here at WHO, I, I have been at the center of it. And one thing I've been so impressed by is the, is the ability, the, the willingness, the collaboration shown by scientists from around the world, regardless of any kind of uh, political overtones that may be happening, the scientists have not wavered in their commitment to work together to find solutions, whether it's diagnostics, whether it's doing collaborative global clinical trials for drugs and therapeutics, or whether it's in the field of vaccines, which we hope will eventually be the, the solution. Um, which will help us to get over this and get back to our normal lives. But of course, the, the downside, another, uh, I would say, collateral damage is that attention to other diseases does suffer. Uh, uh, resources are drying up uh, for investment into uh, both research and practice of other diseases, control of other diseases. We are very worried about what will be the impact on diseases like tuberculosis, on malaria, on HIV, on non-communicable diseases, but of course on rare diseases as well. And so as we move forward, we will continue to support countries to achieve universal health coverage. Now universal health coverage is that all people should have access to essential health services when and where they need them without facing financial hardship. And all people obviously includes people who may have rare diseases as well. So it should include easy and affordable access to diagnosis, to treatment, to medicines, to genetic therapies if necessary, and to supportive care for all kinds of rare diseases, no matter where these individuals live. We know that we are far away from achieving this, this ideal in many, many countries, and that we have a, a, a distance to travel. But what is encouraging is that more and more heads of state are committing to this, committing to universal health coverage, also because it has become clear that it's clearly linked with health security. You cannot have health security without universal health coverage. And heads of uh, states are interested in providing health security for their own citizens and their population. So we have to remain very optimistic. We have to remain focused on where we want to go. There's a long journey ahead of us. We, the pandemic, we do see the light at the end of the tunnel. We will be over this and back on track, but we'll have a lot of catching up to do because of all of this other collateral effects that have happened. So I would like to end by saying WHO would, would always stand by, by groups like DART and other networks of mostly very, very committed parents who are trying to advance the field of rare diseases. I get a lot of emails from the parents of, of children with different kinds of rare diseases where they are pleading for help uh, and support. Um, and one of our concerns, of course, is that sometimes these therapies which are developed do not become available and accessible and affordable to people in the developing world. And that's a very tragic uh, situation to be in when you know there's a treatment, but you can't 
you know, access it. And I remember from my own career, this is the situation in HIV in the early 90s, uh, late 80s, where you knew there was treatment. Patients knew that you could have antiretroviral drugs, but not in India at that time, uh, because it was costing $10,000 Uh, at one point to, to have those drugs. And then, of course, we had the huge revolution, thanks to uh, people like Yusuf Hamid, who started making these generic antiretroviral drugs, which uh, saved lives, not only in India, but has saved millions of lives uh, in Africa, in the global south. And then people realized that just because you live in a developing country doesn't mean that the best treatments cannot reach and cannot be effective. So I think that's been a lesson for the world. It changed the paradigm of treatment. And I hope that same thing will happen for, for these rare diseases. So let us uh, commit ourselves again today uh, on the Duchenne Awareness Day to work. We are, of course, specifically here committing ourselves to Duchenne, but I think the same thing applies for the other diseases um, that I talked about, related diseases, both muscular and others. And, um, Again, I would like to really pay my respects and appreciation and um, admiration mm -hmm. for uh, Mr. Anand and, and the entire group of people who are behind DART, including all the scientists and the many doctors in Bangalore and beyond Bangalore who have helped this organization get to where it is today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, ma'am, for those words of encouragement. Uh, I would like to ask, uh, uh, Anand, sir, to give a small uh, thanks. What a thanks, sir. So, yeah. Morning, doctor. Samia, how are you? Uh, not able to worry. I'm not able to hear. Fine. Thank you so much. So nice to yeah. see you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, same here. Same here. And thank you so much for uh, taking time out uh, in these conditions, these times. I'm sure you must be really pressed for, uh, for a lot of other engagements. Thank you for taking time out and uh, nice to see you again on screen. <laughs> so we keep seeing you once in a while on television, uh, but uh, this, is, this is something very special. And uh, you've always been special to Dart and all the children and all the families. And once again, thank you for all your support. And uh, yeah, we realize uh, funding is not uh, WHO's forte, uh, but through to WHO, uh, probably once we uh, you know, reach the next stage or to reach the next stage, we can use your guidance and your help to reach out to uh, individuals or you know, associations or uh, people who can help us in, in, because we are a small uh, group of uh, guys and girls trying to do something uh, totally out of our league. And, uh, and, 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 but the support has been there from ICMR to start with. Now, finally, drug controller has also appreciated and given us the much required. Uh, and to let you know, I don't know if I did mention, uh, so our manufacturing facility has also been uh, sort of certified now. Uh, and now we have a full-fledged uh, system where we can, uh, you know, manufacture the uh, oligonucleotides for various mutations and mm -hmm. start the clinical trials. Um, we're still looking for a lot of funding for that. So I won't trouble you with that now. Okay, and uh, thank you so much and hope to uh, connect with you again soon. Yeah. Yes. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Lots of love to all the children. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. And as ma'am correctly told us. It's about uh, inclusion, about getting everybody. In. That's a wonderful segue for me to call the next person because we have been talking about sustainable development goals and how the United Nations in, in special should add rare diseases to it. And who better to talk about it than one of, our, uh, one of the leading names in biotechnology, it, not only in Bangalore, but in the world, Professor Vijay Chandra. So I'd like to ask Professor Vijay Chandra to come forward and take the floor, please. Um, thank you, buddy. I'm trying to. Uh, so, do I have? I have the uh, control. Okay, thank you. And, uh, 
Yes, I have given you share. Yes. Yes. Uh, I just uh, now let me get to full screen, then we can start. Yeah. Thank you. So, uh, uh, good morning, everyone, and a special good morning to Dr. Samia Swaminathan as well. Uh, I uh, um, I I decided to uh, speak uh, out about uh, uh, the need for perhaps calling out uh, orphan diseases as a specific sustainable development goal. Uh, so I, of course, uh, you know I have no official sanction from from uh, uh, the um, you know, United Nations or any of the agencies uh, to call this the Sustainable Development Goal number 18. But I do believe uh, it is uh, sort of the moral responsibility of societies uh, around the world now to, to pay specific attention to rare and orphan diseases. And uh, towards this, uh, this uh, 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 focus, I think, uh, uh, let us uh, sort of apply ourselves. I've been working on some ideas uh, to actually uh, think further about how by 2030, we could actually have mechanisms that at least, you know, provide some succor to the the orphan diseases uh, at at a scale that that we wanted to right uh, and I'm being joined in this work by Chintan Vaishnav who's a professor at MIT uh, at the Tata Center there and so he brings in sort of the policy and uh, health economics uh, perspectives uh, in in the center uh, enterprise that we've set ourselves so as I think as Dr Swaminathan just mentioned, in some ways, the software, uh, the sustainable development goals, the SDGs, uh, do include orphan diseases uh, as well by, and by the principle of leaving no one behind. And, uh, but I do believe that unless we call out uh, orphan diseases, uh, they, they will always be uh, the last to get the attention uh, of of agencies, and um, so so I do believe that that we need to to make uh, make this message go out uh, that uh, that we do need to uh, have some focus on uh, orphan diseases, and the goal really should be that by 2030 we have no disease orphan, right? So, so it's not, at least there is some attention to every such uh, rare disorder. Um, I think, uh, you know, we've already uh, been uh, watching as, as the Indian uh, funding agencies and governments and national policies have been rolled out uh, for um, rare diseases. Uh, as we know, in 2017, there was there was a there was a policy that was uh, that was announced. Then it was revised, and then it got re uh, uh, you know uh, uh, came back as uh, as a policy very recently, um, and uh, and it's clear that. The focus, in, you know, does seem to be more towards uh, using public uh, resources for diagnosis, for understanding the disease burden, for providing some counseling, and uh, you know, but uh, treatment is really being sort of left to other uh, other means, uh, really through. Um, uh, you know, either uh, getting uh, philanthropic funding or, you know, or uh, finding business models that, that will allow 
uh, industry and uh, and social venture to to take this forward right um, but uh, I think the uh, there's still a long way to go uh, and uh, and I think uh, uh, what what we also uh, would like to leverage is the fact that there is now a great deal of uh, interest in, in the government in India to actually focus on digital health and, and to use technology in many ways to, um, to leapfrog as, as much as is possible um, to, uh, to address several of the, the health challenges we have, including that of uh, orphan diseases. Um, and uh, so towards this uh, idea, I think uh, what we have laid out is kind of a, a research agenda, which would actually start building uh, representations through modeling, uh, which, is, which is what uh, we know how to do. Uh, and uh, towards, uh, uh, you know, modeling the dynamics of, of the healthcare systems that would need to come into place to actually address uh, orphan diseases. Uh, I will not go into the details of the modeling methodologies, uh, but there, uh, there is uh, certainly focus on how to uh, look at the dynamics of awareness and access to care, um, how the care capacity uh, is, is represented and uh, the logistics model and the diagnostic uh, aspects. So the diagnosis and treatment options are also looked at as a, as a system, I think. So what we need is if we want to have impact at scale, we need to take a systems view and of course, equitable access, accurate diagnosis, and affordable treatment are really the three uh, three goals uh, here. And uh, but and it does seem that at least the first two we can make some uh, you know systemic improvements in how we go about this, and that is that is probably the whole approach of this uh, this modeling effort. Um, there, uh, quite uh, uh, by coincidence, I found yesterday uh, uh, a wonderful paper uh, that was just published in the British Medical Journal uh, about how uh, you know artificial intelligence and augmented AI will actually support diagnosis and treatment of rare diseases, and how, uh, in some sense, they, they have also looked at the goal of 2030. This was a group of researchers in Germany, and uh, and you know there's essentially uh, an approach to clinical decision support, which actually involves uh, various aspects of um, you know communication between patients, physicians, and um, and and the health uh, uh, providers, right? So so this uh, and how uh, electronic health records. Um, you know, and uh, methodologies like machine reasoning can be brought to play uh, you know, to to actually uh, start building uh, systems that that can that can actually uh, improve uh, the performance at scale. Right. Uh, let me just end with uh, also uh, you know the hope. Uh, that there can be a scale up of the kinds of uh, agendas that DART and Hanujan are now taking forward, uh, namely the antisense uh, oligotherapies. Uh, although it will not be uh, clearly a universal uh, treatment methodology for, uh, for rare diseases in general, um, uh, there, there could be substantial uh, relief that can be brought to many, many disorders using these methodologies. And again, through the use of, um, you know, the information technology, artificial intelligence, uh, we have seen that the work in 
Toronto by the University of Toronto and the medical centers there, which have come together uh, to actually create an extraordinary uh, comprehensive set of genetic variants and their predicted effects uh, for humans, uh, for splicing uh, techniques. Uh, and uh, this has actually led to the creation of a company called Deep Genomics. And uh, we're already seeing the, the first success stories just in four or five years now. And uh, uh, this has been for a particular treatment of, uh, of Wilson's disease. Uh, and, uh, but we should, you know, look forward to many such successes uh, using the ASO approach uh, that uh, that can come about uh, because of, uh, you know, someone actually thinking how to do this at scale and, uh, and starting to put together uh, the puzzle. So uh, I do believe it's time for us to think about doing some of this uh, in, uh, in India and uh, taking a systemic approach to uh, making sure that by 2030, uh, there is no disease orphan in India. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, Professor Vijay Chandru, uh, it's been an honor having you with us and thank you for all the, especially all the motivational talk you've given and you're truly an inspiration to all of us. Thank you, sir. Uh, we carry on to the next part of our session and we are now talking about the people who matter a lot to these children. And those are their teachers, their mentors, and the people who are with them on the educational front. So the first person I'd like to call on screen uh, is Manju Balangam, who is the principal of uh, Delhi Public School, Bangalore North. We've known her for a long time. Uh, she was, she is the principal of Delhi Public School when Karan joined, and she has been a huge inspiration and motivation for us. Uh, Ma'am, can you can we have you uh, on screen, please? Manjuman, let me just find her. Uh, in the meantime, I would like to say uh, once again, the second edition of the Dart Shins newsletter is available. Uh, it's online. Uh, the link has been cha shared in the chat or you can go to www.india.in where we have both the conference brochure and the newsletter for, from where you can find further details. Uh, the, the newsletter also has a section called this, this this quarter that year, where we talk about all the things that DART has done over the years and the good times and also some of the sad times that we've been through, but they all make up the amazing adventure that led to us being here right now. Uh, we will call Manju Ma'am once she's available. I think we're having a small technical issue. Uh, is doc Dr. A. Nagaratna, if Ma'am is ready now, can, yes, she's here. Uh, Dr. Nagaratna is a principal of MS Ramya College of Arts and Sciences. Um, she, uh, she has been a huge pillar of support for us. Uh, Karan Veer is uh, her favorite student and she is his favorite principal in college. Technically, she's the only principal in college right now, so obviously default favorite. Uh, we enjoy working with her. I would like Dr. Nagaratna to talk about the role of educational institutions in the lives of special children. Uh, Ma'am? Uh yeah, uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. We can hear you, ma'am. I will just share your PPT as well. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, uh, see, uh, the role of uh, in educational institutions in the lives of special children is very important because in the uh, institutes of higher education, we come across a lot of uh, children with uh, different type of disabilities. And we... Uh, we see that this disability is a multidimensional and complex construct and there is no single universally accepted definition of disability. Uh, definitions differ across the countries, but uh, it changes from country to country, evolving various, uh, what you call it as legal, political, social discourses. 
and rather it is very difficult to find the reliable data about the prevalence of disability in india uh, can you just uh, put the first slide uh, berti uh, we we uh, come across uh, uh, children with uh, special needs you know different type of physical disabilities especially and uh, these include the loss of limbs respiratory disorders the blindness epilepsy hearing loss chronic fatigue muscular dystrophy uh, visually uh, uh, challenged children you know lot of uh, children across uh, who come to join the institutions of higher education uh, normally uh, there are children with also the mental disabilities uh, such as dyslexia dyspraxia communicative disorders uh, stuttering speech difficulties developmental delays due to down syndrome and so on and so forth next slide next slide please uh, we also hello uh, next slide slide number 3 can you hear me yes ma'am we are on slide 3 uh ma'am we are on slide 3 ma'am oh i think ma'am i think ma'am has been logged out uh ma'am can you hear us disorders and obsessive compulsive disorders you know lot of uh, these type of children uh, we come across uh, in our daily life next next slide uh, when we come to the children with special needs uh, in india we come across about 27 million people are there with a the special needs that constitutes about 2.2% of our population out of which 4.6 million people are in the age group of 10 to 19 years that means most of these children particularly with the disability are only from the elementary school to a primary school to an elementary school and maybe very less number of students come to an institution of higher education like for example in the age group of 0 to 6 years we have 2 million children however according to the education report of india latest 2019 we come across 61% of the children in the age group of 5 to 19 attend educational institutions of any sort 89% of this population are in the elementary school but when it comes to the secondary level education out of these 89% only about 8.5% go to the secondary school and when it comes to the institutions of higher education we get about only 2.3% of the children i mean you know beyond this you can imagine the number of children mm -hmm. with the special needs do not even get a privilege of getting into an institution of higher level higher education or learning higher learning next uh it's a great challenge in educating these uh, children with the special needs particularly when it comes to the economic issue you know it's uh, we've been listening to so many speakers prior to me the clinical uh, field uh, we have we have the people from the research field you know and clinical uh, field you uh, we we just heard about how much uh, amount of uh, money has to be spent in rearing these type of children i was just hearing to dr uh, arun shastri is uh, talking about 20 lakhs per year per child you know that's the type of uh, finance that's uh, uh, required to uh, take care of these children and i know that it is very difficult to raise a child with this type of special need it's a very costly affair Uh, particularly when it comes to medication special aids such as wheelchair crutches hearing aids and so on all these are very expensive you know they need to take care of the children after reaching adulthood uh, uh, further you know and uh, second important challenge that we come across today is 
the social acceptance of disabled children which is very poor in india because you know we come across uh, these type of children not being accepted in the society as much as the children of other types you know so next uh, there is a legal angle also uh, particularly uh, you know because uh, you know there are uh, disabilities of a different range and in india if a child has to be said that he is a physically challenged or a disabled child we need to have a legal certification from the competent authorities and not all the hospitals are given the rights to issue it the certificate has to be obtained from a particular uh, hospital designated by the government government to issue a certificate only then you, the children get the certificate with the disability and uh, uh, you know uh, the children uh, are not getting easy scholarships prosthetic aids and also access to any type of government schemes particularly you know there there is a problem in getting all these things technologically a lack of access to the motorized wheelchair prosthetic limbs hearing aids and particularly there are several parents of the disabled children who lack the awareness about the subsidies that is available for these children by the government in the government next current situation in india uh, it's actually a process based issue there are lot lot of uh, uh, facilities not available lack of teachers who are trained particularly to handle children like these lack of teaching learning resources you don't get the resources particularly to teach the children of uh, the uh, who are having uh, any type of disability and uh, the third important point is lack in classroom tolerance this we come across almost all the institutions probably uh, in in the school level elementary school level uh, secondary level and even at a at a higher level and the government policies are not very clear you come across so many unclear policies particularly when it comes to right of children to free and compulsory education under rt act 2009 which includes children with special needs between the age group of 6 to 14 years should be given a free education and uh, these policies are not very clear you know still there are schools with disabled children where they are uh, being charged and the they charge the schools charge the same amount of fees as they charge for any other child you know instead of giving a subsidy or a free education because and there is no control by the government on these uh, schools particularly next slide uh, the country lacks a central body particularly to uh, the regulators to frame guidelines for the children with a special need when it comes to the national education policy 2019 also which is not very clear in educating the children with special needs our uh, our policy national education policy also is not giving any clear cut uh, subsidy or any clear cut guidelines particularly the children with the special needs uh, many higher education institutions do not give admissions to the children with disability we come across this very common uh, Uh, that uh, you know uh, the the schools and colleges refuse to admit the children with the disability there's a lot of confusion that is prevailing in choosing uh, you know parents also find it difficult you know whom to approach because there is a ministry of social justice and empowerment who promotes separate schools for the special needs children and there's another ministry of human resource development mhrd who promotes the uh, children to be included in regular classroom that's why i was mentioning that the policies are not very clear from the government whether the children with special needs to approach the social justice and empowerment uh, 
organization or the MHRD promotes the children to be included in a regular classroom along with the regular children, there is still a confusion for the parents whom to approach. Next slide, please. Uh, there are a lot of government initiatives that's already available, actually. And these government initiatives include Sarva Shikshana Abhyan, uh, which is uh, which is both state funded and uh, central funded. Rashtriya Madhimik Shikshana Abhyan, which is found, uh, funded uh, exclusively by center. And then Vikaspedia website, which gives a lot of information, particularly for the children with uh, disabled. Sugamya Pustakalaya. Uh, this is one such uh, Sugama Puskalia is an online library that contains books which are accessible, uh, particularly to blind uh, people. And uh, it's very difficult because, uh, you know, uh, these children are not even aware of such an uh, online library is available with the Braille uh, Lippy for the children. So it is the uh, role and responsibility of an institution to educate the, these type of children uh, to make use of the facilities that is actually available uh, right now. Uh, there are uh, special accredited institutions for education uh, of the disadvantaged uh, children, uh, particularly aims to be, uh, to be included as an inclusive education, zero rejection policy, education of children between age group 6 to 14, is a fundamental right of every child, uh, even under the RTE. Uh, next slide. Uh, now, since March, uh, since the COVID pandemic has uh, started all of a sudden, we come across online classes and the particularly online classes has been across the world, everywhere, you know, we have moved from a traditional education from the classroom to an online uh, coaching. And since March, we have haphazardly shifted our lives online. And our societal dynamics does not allow to all resources of intersectionality of class, caste, region, and especially ableism, access to various types of electronic devices, assistive technologies, internet, and the availability of these resources for the children for online education is something, you know, which is becoming really challenging. And the majority of the disabled children do not have these type of facilities. You have a class of children who are privileged to have all these type of facilities. So when, uh, when it is being offered, they are able to access to that and they are able to make use of this facility. However, there are a bigger number of children who are not having an access to all these type of technologies to learn. So digital learning has actually widened the gap between the affluent and the marginalized, and especially children with the special needs. Even Swayam, that's an e platform, uh, which is actually uh, by, uh, introduced by the MHRD, do not have the needs of children with special needs into consideration because it just goes on and the children have to learn on their own using these platforms. But when it comes to visually impaired children, brain documents are not easily accessible because it's not a script that can be taught virtually and uh, it is highly impossible to conduct online classes for the visually challenged children. And uh, uh, the hearing impaired children cannot attend the online classes because they, they do not have a facility for the hearing impaired children to learn what is being taught online, you know. So again, they are uh, losing out uh, with the regular student in the online uh, uh, classes or e-learning mode. Now, e-learning has shifted the entire burden of education of an individual child and the parents totally on the parents and they are totally helpless what is to be followed to do this to accept or to make this kind of education available for the children next slide uh, education for children with the special needs at present there are more than 3000 special schools for the disabled children 
or which are functioning in the country of which 900 institutions are specialized for hearing impaired 400 institutions are available for visual impaired 1000 institutions are available for mentally retarded 700 plus institutions with physical disability but most of these institutions what i am uh, speaking about are all on the primary and the elementary grades only but when it comes to higher education higher education institution consider many higher education institutions consider children with disabilities as incompetent when compared to the normal children and hence hesitate to give them admission and in the higher educational institutional level you don't come across a single institution of higher education exclusively for the children with any type of disability so there is no uh, facility that is provided for these type of children however of late the government is coming out with lot of new schemes and lot of new uh, things probably there will be a ray of hope in the institution of higher education uh, and uh, especially for the children if there is going to be a quota in all these government schemes next slide please uh, let me just give a closing remark inclusiveness is the key so all the higher educational institutions or elementary uh, institutions institutions of secondary education primary education they should be an inclusiveness particularly in the in terms of policies uh, when it comes to government policy or creating its own uh, culture by making an uh, inclusiveness in education uh, uh, also in the higher education and accepting all these children with disabilities in the society by the by these institutions as a family or the relatives as they accept uh, the institutions also should accept all these children and evolving new type of inclusive policies and practices by providing a specially accessible infrastructure for the needs of these children and the possible uh, the student teacher ratio should be maintained uh, when the when it comes to the children with disabilities and the government should think including the policies the educational programs to provide a curriculum which should be flexible for the children with different type of disabilities however parents play a very important role in uplifting and recognizing the needs to identify the child's potential and that we come across through a constant effort particularly by the dart team i have been associated in a in a different way with dart because i am not a clinician i am not a scientist i am not a doctor however you know i have been associated with dart for a past couple of months what i find is dart is doing a wonderful job in bringing these type of children with disabilities together and providing a platform and providing the type of uh, the treatment that is going on and they are providing so much of they are doing so much of an effort in finding out a possible cure for these type of disability particularly when it comes to muscular dystrophy and so many other and uh, uh, i should congratulate uh, uh, dr ravi panan the his wife movin anand and dr arun shastri for the constant effort in, uh, in in bringing uh, these type of children together under the dart family uh, and uh, it's it's really wonderful that they play a such a good role and uh, I, what, what i understand is uh, that uh, the parents also should realize that they should not compare the child with another child of uh, who is uh, doing good so thank you so much dart uh dr M mr anand and mrs anand for providing me an opportunity to share a few words in this forum uh, uh, particularly when it comes to the role of higher educational institutions thank you so much 
thank you ma'am thank you so much uh, it is indeed uh, it is indeed not an easy thing to make an entire education system and an education institution inclusive uh, we appreciate your efforts and thank you so much and we now are uh, honored to call uh, manju arif ma'am uh, from dps school hello ma'am welcome back hey buddy uh, how are you we good ma'am thank you so much for joining us thank you for taking time off of your busy schedule uh yes ma'am uh, ma'am would be talking about the importance of inclusive education and she is one person who not only talks but then walks what she talks and we appreciate her from the bottom of our heart for that and ma'am floor is yours thank you thank you bertie uh, uh thank you uh, karan thank you move thank, thank you uh, uh, mr anand uh, arun and the entire team at uh, dart for uh, you know giving me an opportunity year after year to be a part of your lives a part of your program a part of all that wonderful work that you do in fact i was absolutely disabled today and that timely call from moven got me to be on the program just once again uh, this line between ability and disability is so fine it's so fine that it is often misunderstood okay. Okay. i was asked to speak about what okay. educational institutions can do through an inclusive atmosphere i want to tell the world that there is no other way other than inclusion everybody needs to live together this is life's reality you cannot live in silos you need to be together and disability is a part of the continuum in everybody's life you know from the time you were born as a child when you couldn't you know you were dependent on very many people to when you become a really old person when again you become dependent on someone else this this is a continuum there are times in your life when you can manage and there are times when you need others so disability is a continuum it's in our minds that we say that the visually impaired the hearing impaired uh, children with uh, uh, motor disabilities psychological issues learning disabilities these are terms each one of us has something that is lacking and we need others around to prop us up to help us and to you know get us to do whatever we doing to our fullest uh, ability uh, i speak at many conferences for the work that dps bangalore north has done in terms of inclusion and we were very fortunate to be recognized by the president of india and for us to get the national award in 2018 and on that note that award actually starts and goes to karanveer anand because he taught us he was our teacher in inclusion he taught us what it mean what it means to have children who are differently able in the school and that they given these uh, surroundings the environment the love and affection that all children deserve can prove themselves to be the best karan ended up as head boy of the school ended up with a cgpa 10 in 10 standard and a 94.8% in his 12th is on a scholarship so i don't know what we did for him but we certainly know that we learned a lot from him life is about not becoming independent it's about interdependence you know that we all need one another so where can there be a special school there are children who need intensive care and intensive uh, support i can understand those children having that kind of a system otherwise children who all children need company they need to be with their peers they need to be in a working environment where they can have fun and if that situation or or affection an institute can provide all children will do well and children who are exceptional will do better i i think we need to move away from the word of special as well and say exceptional because these kids are exceptional and so are their parents it is so so heartwarming to see what dart is doing year after year the milestones they achieve and i would like to wish everybody gathered here a wonderful world jushin's awareness day and the second virtual uh, conference that is happening i was there at the first and nothing stops there are no barriers when i see the darshans i i i firmly believe and reaffirm my faith 
that they can progress. From the team of psychophysiotherapists to the doctors to the community engagement that they bring about is phenomenal. Uh, coming back to the NEP because it's being much talked about, um, I would like to let all the parents and educators who are there in this platform know that muscular dystrophy has been clearly mentioned in the NEP 2020. It is one of those 21 disabilities that has been given and in terms of scribe, in terms of extra time, these children have all the facilities. Also, a higher education is going to move on to carry the uh, inclusive practices that begin at school and children are going to get additional support there. Another thing that I really liked about the NEP, which works out for children with disability is the flexibility in choosing subjects. Very, very vast from 9 to 12, you can have this extensive subject combination which children would like to take, which can again extend it to majors and minors when they go on to higher education. It also talks about, uh, you know, if you drop out of a year of higher education, the kind of uh, certification that you get, two years would be a diploma, so three years would be a degree, and you could always come back to education. I think this kind of flexibility helps everybody. This was not made for children with special ability, uh, needs. It was made for everybody. And you see when you have universal design in your thought process, it kind of helps everyone. What did we learn through inclusion? We, we learned that our school ecosystem is stronger. It's more vibrant. It's more diverse. There is a legacy that Karan has left behind of creating a post on the prefectorial board that talks about having about disability and inclusion and diversity. Today, that post is held by a girl with visual impairment who's an NCC cadet. She is going to the United Nations talking about her work with people from, with, uh, talking about gender equality. She's working with transgenders. Now, that is the learning that can come out of it. It, each, each step that we have gone through makes me feel that children learn best when schools are inclusive and educational institutions are inclusive, when there is this togetherness, there is this beautiful picture, I don't have it here on the screen, but talks about equity, where children are standing across a fence watching a football match and they're standing on different levels of chairs so that all of them can see. And this is what uh, inclusive schools can do, is give the child an, a, a playing field that is specific to her or his needs. Uh, I have grown as a person. My institution has grown uh, and gained recognition globally because of our inclusive practices. What has it done to us? It's made us better human beings. It's made us more empathetic. What has it done for our children? It has made them global citizens uh, across. They are looking at careers that look at inclusion and diversity. One of them is already working towards that. What has it done to my support staff? They have become more accepting. So a school population of about 28,000 students, parents, children, support staff are more aware. And they take the message back home. And I think one of the, the biggest things that has happened is uh, during COVID times, my team going out, not being scared of, of the disease, but going out safely and carefully and helping people out. I think that is the beauty of diversity. We would have not known colors if there was just white and black. We, we know colors because of its, you know, the differences that are there. I'd like everybody, every school institution, most school institutions are scared to bring children with special needs into their fold because they think they can't do it. But bring the children with their families. Open your doors to the community so that people who are experts in the field of special ed will come and help you and make your school a more beautiful place. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Hold on right there. I think I know what you're talking about. Check out the screen right now. And I love this picture and I'm so glad you brought it up. So this is what ma'am was talking about. The first picture shows three people standing on equal platforms and how uh, only one of them is able to see and one of them cannot see, the small kid cannot see. Absolutely. That, and the other one is equality where it's been distributed differently 
but the outcome is better for everyone. So I think, ma'am, this is what you were talking about. Yes, buddy, that's the picture I was talking about, and that's been my favorite picture. It kind of shows the difference between equality and equity, and and so this is a very special picture for me. Thank you, ma'am, and of course, just like that picture, you are very special to us. So. Thank you for joining us. You please have a good day, ma'am. Uh, Bertie, there's a question. There's a question that's come up, saying someone in Gurgaon, uh, yeah. the child was refused admission in DPS Gurgaon. Okay. Uh, I just Michel, want to tell the parent that go back, take the CBSE document with you, and say that you know uh, this is included. I can support. Allow me to come into the school. I'm there. With my child, you know, whenever he or she wants to use the washroom, you just give me a place to sit. I will come. Just let my kid in, and then have to sit. Let the child in. Thank you so much, ma'am, for answering that. Thank you so much, ma'am. You please have a good day. Uh, and to every, uh, we have been getting lots of comments uh, on the chat, and we've been talking about treatment options. So this is to all of you out there. Please stay in tune. We will talk about treatment. Dr. Arun Shastri, Chief Scientific Officer of DART, will talk with you at the end of this session. We will have a 10-minute open forum where you can ask your questions. You can put in the questions in chat right now if you don't have time later. Dr. Arun will come onto screen and talk about treatment, treatment options, what and all is available. But we have just Two, uh, we have just three more speakers to go for the education session. The next speaker is uh, Rema Nandakumar Man, who is the Dean of Sunset Group of Schools. And she will be talking about a lot of mentors. Uh, may I ask Rema Ma'am to come onto the video uh, screen, please. And after that, will be followed by Dr. Aruna Karpur, uh, who is a teacher and a DMB. And to finish off the education session will be Ms. Jessie Jeffrey, who will be talking about Telehealth as a game changer. And after that, please stay in tune. Dr. Arun Shastri will be with you and she'll be and he'll be talking to you about treatment options. Um, right now, I'd like to call Rama, ma'am. Uh, she is. Thank you, ma'am, for being the floor is all yours. I shall open up your PPT in a minute. Ma'am, can you unmute yourself, ma'am? I'll just ask you to unmute. Uh, Ma'am, we are still unable to hear you. Ah, yes. Okay, okay. Because so you had to unmute me. Anyway, yeah, good. Very nice to be here. Happy morning to you all. Listening to all the eminent speakers, doctor, the doctors, Dr. Rao, uh, and the principals, Dr. Nagaratna, ma'am, and Dr. Manju. It took me back by several years and I asked myself whether we have done justice to the exceptional children whom we had admitted in our schools. I remember quite well that we used to res restrict seats to 5% of the school admissions. Uh, I do not want the slides now. Can you just remove this, Bertie? Hello? I don't need the slides now. Yeah, I will let you know when I want that. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, so when I think about my uh, principalship and the deanship, the first thing is in my first school, during the first week of my principalship, while I was going on my rounds, I noticed one fourth standard child sitting in the class alone while conversing with him. I understood that the class was having physical education and he is unable to attend the class as he could not walk. His name was Karthik and that he joined the school when he was three years old. I went and brought him some books from the library and carried on my day. During the lunch break, I went to his class and asked him whether he liked the storybooks. All the students were so surprised and asked me, how do you know Karthik? And when did you give, to, give him the books? I used that opportunity to make his classmates understand that we have to be compassionate and help him in whichever way we can. Within a month, the school leader walked into my room and asked, ma'am, 
can we buy a wheelchair for kartik i asked him are you talking about kartik in grade 4 yes ma'am how do you know him my friend's brother is in his class i replied okay it will be a great help for his mother if we buy a wheelchair for him kartik was from a very poor family his sister was the breadwinner in his family the students collected the money and we bought a wheelchair for him after that day i used to see his friends taking him to the ground during the assembly and pt time after that day i used to see his i have never seen him alone he was well taken care of by his classmates unfortunately when he was in grade 8 he passed away due to a cardiac arrest at this moment i have to thank you all the dark team for doing the wonderful job we did not have i did not know how to help that child at all i did not even know about this muscle dystrophy anyway time passed i moved out from that school and the second school where i was working now is samsit mount literacy school when amaya's parents approached me for admission i was ever ready to admit him with one condition his mother aruna also has to join the school as a teacher i wanted her to be around him to take care of his needs amaya is the most popular child in our school we used to make sure that on all annual days he has a special role and a special entry his intelligence delivery of speech drawing skills and his amazing sense of humor have made him popular in the school i have always made sure that his classroom is opposite to the principal's room in fact our pre primary wing is in the ground floor and we did not have a lift in the school so that one big room on the ground floor became his permanent classroom things have changed now we have a lift in the school and he has an electric chair to move around wonderful having interacted with many exceptional needs children during my career i have realized that a good counselor can become their mentor to help them to have a positive attitude in their life these children are deprived from many things that the normal children have or able to do in a school scenario this muscle dystrophy in children are wheelchair bound most of the time they feel very sad and lonely when the other children run around and play they also feel left out of the normal activities of the class when the other children go out to the library lab assembly etc they are unable to accept their own physical limitations this is where the counselor and parents have to play a role and explain to them to utilize their time in doing things they are capable of doing like reading painting writing etc it is important to sensitize the other children in the class about the physical limitations of their classmates they should also be made aware that these children are capable of normal academic activity in the classroom they have to be told that they need to be more patient and compassionate when they deal with them they should make an effort to involve them in as many activities as possible and here the teacher plays an important role in setting up the ground rules regarding the do's and the don'ts in the class peer learning is a very novel and tested way by which children who are mature enough to understand the limitations of these special needs children can be made responsible to teach them simple concepts about each topic this also encourages camaraderie among the children and a sense of involvement the parents are already going through a lot of anxiety and stress regarding their child they also have to deal with the other health issues of the child besides doctor consultations therapy sessions home care etc 
the parents certainly deserve our compassion and understanding however parents should be realistic about what they can expect from the child and from the school they should not put too much pressure on the child to participate in activities especially where the child is hesitant to take part nor should they insist that their child should be included in all activities which may disturb the rhythm of the class can i have the slides please now let me now talk about how we have been the development in samsit group of schools this will bring an insight into how we develop sensitivity acceptability in the children the mission is preparing for that and the mission is each and every child is unique and we have to identify and nurture each child to make them a, make them a leader in their life values are based and fundamental beliefs that guide motivation attitudes or actions they help determine what is important to us values are non negotiable the sort of person we want to be which we treat ourselves and others and our interaction with the world around they provide general guidelines of our contact will needs children out the school principals and the teachers take of meeting with and sensitize the other in the school in our some next slide please in our some schools we have made character and not just a moral science like moral qualities unique to an individual an aggregate of features and traits the individual nature one person the concepts of character imply a variety of attributes including the essence or lack of virtues such as courage attitude honesty honesty and good behaviors or habits when we work on these elements we are working to develop the character of an individual or a group on a on a cultural level the set of moral behaviors to which a social group adheres is strong and can unite the define it culturally as distinct from others the three defining values of samsit culture are happiness humility and compassion happiness a sense of well being joy or contentment humility is the quality of having a modest or low importance of self compassion is the understanding someone else's situation and possessing the desire to take action in order to improve their lives next slide please the role of a mentor can i have the next slide please the role of a mentor in the development of character in a special need child is very very important the mentor should be well prepared to create a support system for that they should be willing to teach the other children about being sensitive encouraging to include the special needs special need children in their activities even while playing i have seen in our schools the children making the physically challenged ones as the scorekeepers adhd children adhd children being the leader of the group activities and so on the mentor should be empathetic and honest and have the faith in his uh, his or her own ability they should teach the universe uh, the universal languages of friendship and inclusivity inclusivity next slide please i am able to talk about this topic today in this forum is because of my long journey of last 10 years in samsit we have a team of leaders who are continuously working towards the character development and we have done a lot of things to bring a change in our students and the culture in our schools the value integration into lesson plans creating mind maps for teachers 
Samsithantam, which is recited every day in the assembly, placing value boards in all the corridors, having mindful practices in place of transition activities, encouraging them to do the kindness act every day, conducting value-based competition and co-curricular activities, writing three good things every day by all Samsithians, and every month selection of value champs by the class teachers and awarding them by our chairperson, Mr. Srinivasa Rao. We have also created special value education syllabus for grade five to 10 by including topics like grit, mindful meditation, positive psychology, and so on. The outcome of all these practices are many. Next slide, please. The outcome of all these practices are many. You can see here, I have mentioned only some of them. And one of the main things which I have to mention here is our children participating in international value-based competitions and winning prizes. Character development program in schools is helping all our ch school children and helping the special need children and their parents to give a comfortable, inclusive education to their children. Counseling, mentoring, and character development programs will definitely is an answer for inclusive education. The last slide, please. The most important culture in all the schools which we have to include is live and let live and be the change which we love to see in the society. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you. And on behalf of our entire Dashian teams, we would like to thank you for taking your time off in your busy schedule to do this. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. And, that, and now on to uh, Aruna Kapoor, who ma'am just spoke to us about, uh, mother of Ameya and one of the very first Dashians. So, uh, Aruna ma'am, the floor is yours. Please take over. Yes. Good morning, everyone. So, here today I'm going to talk as a parent, mentor, and friend to a special child. So, good morning, everyone. My name is Aruna Karpur. I'm a qualified homeopathic doctor. At present, I'm working as a teacher at the Samsid Mount Literacy School. After Ameya was diagnosed with DMD, there were a lot of things on our mind about the management of the condition. What about the support in school? How would he fit into the society in the neighborhood? Then coming to the medical aspect, we had to do a lot of research. And then uh, we had to co consult a doctor follow his advice on the medication, physiotherapy, and the uh, tests to be done. Uh, we got initial tests done in 2008, November. He was two years old then. DMD was confirmed on basis of some tests, but the mutation was inconclusive. It was later confirmed as a point mutation on exon seven. Now coming to the family support, Family support is very important in this kind of situations. So I have a very strong family support from my in-laws and my sister-in-law. My sister-in-law and her husband who are working as consultant doctors with NHS UK guided us with further consultation and the gene sequencing. We started off Amiya's treatment and the overall management at the age of five. And he's on the same treatment and management till now. Now coming to the other areas. So we as parents should find out the best possible ways that suit us to take care of the child. Now it is very important, I would say that the role of the school and the management uh, in the lives of this special children. It is important to talk to the school administration about the condition and the support required. So for example, facilities such as easy access to the classrooms, laboratories, and to the 
uh, restrooms, keeping in mind about the physical limitations of the children on wheelchair. So academically, these children are very good or sometimes even better than their peers. So as a parent and mentor, it's very important to support your child in every possible way. So we were very fortunate with some group of schools to get the support from the beginning, the teachers, the support staff, and the students, his classmates were very empathetic towards Ameya. They were always ready to lend a helping hand whenever it was required. And then uh, I uh, thought of taking up a job like Rama ma'am said, when we went and met her, so as she had seen a child with the same condition, she had a little idea about this condition and she was very empathetic and she welcomed us with open hands. And then the journey in the school started. So uh, this opportunity was given to me to work as a teacher by none other than our Ramana. So in school, he was included in all the activities as an equal. So he has represented the school in drawing competitions and he also has been a part of the annual day functions, both hosting it and participating. So it is very important to focus on the other activities such as uh, attending birthday parties. It can be a small thing, very simple thing, but then it matters so that the child feels that he's normal, very normal and equal to others. And uh, he likes going out and watching movies. So he's also a member of a, a book club and cultural activity club in our apartment. And at home, his sister Ahana, uh, who helps him uh, like with his activities and his uh, best friend, I miss him. And at home, we have some uh, pets. So he likes playing with them and uh, the pets uh, really give a positive environment. Like they uh, keep us lively, like he enjoys being with them. So everyone needs to find a way to include th uh, these uh, special children in their normal life so that suits them we can all get be as parents can get all the help if we seek out reach and explain and uh, finally i would tell to the parents be positive and keep going there is hope thank you thank you aruna that is so sweet that is so nice thank you so much uh, our love and our uh, all our character to uh, both of them. Uh, by the way, to everybody out there, uh, like she, like both Rama Ma'am and Aruna said, uh, Amaya has a lovely work of art and we will be showcasing some of his art in our uh, future editions of the Dashin's newsletter. And we're also thinking about putting it online for um, public viewing because it's really lovely. Uh, the next person, the last person to round up this session is Miss Jessie Jeffrey, who is uh, a specialist in telemedicine and teletherapy. Uh, Jessie, can I ask you to switch on your video, please? And once she's here, uh, after that, let me again tell you that please stay online. Uh, we have Dr. Arun Shastri joining us. And Dr. Arun Shastri uh, will be talking to all of you about treatment. And she and he is uh, getting ready with all the questions that you put in the chat. So make sure that when he is there, you can ask your questions. But before that, it's now Ms. Jesse Jeffrey. Hi, Jesse. Good morning. Hello. Yes. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, as it's 12 6 now. And first of all, I'd love to thank the entire team DART for giving me this opportunity to speak along with a panel of such esteemed speakers, experienced and incredible speakers. So my topic is going to be telehealth as a game changer. And let me just dive straight into it. So what is telehealth, you may ask. Telehealth is nothing but a mode of service delivery. And it is providing therapy through online, uh, the online platform through telecommunication telecommunication technology. So telehealth for me, because I'm a developmental therapist, it would be to do with cognition and behavior. But if it was a physiotherapist, then telehealth would be a telephysiotherapy. So therapy through uh, online, but with physiotherapy. And the main uh, difference from normal therapy and teletherapy is that it's a parent coaching model. I'm using parent, but I'd like to say that parent can be 
primary caregiver, can be the grandparents, can be any adult that spends the most time with the child. Uh, mostly it's the parents, so parents is what I'm using, but it can be used interchangeably. Now, as a mental health professional, there needs to be a consistent focus on mental health, emotional health, and social health. Otherwise, there's a tendency to see something called regression, wherein the current progress the child is at is reduced because there is no intervention. Or there is a tendency for new undesirable, say, behaviors to occur because what is supposed to be addressed is not being addressed. So my belief is that some intervention is better than no intervention, which is where I bring in the concept of telehealth. Telehealth has been around for quite some time. Um, the two main pioneers for telehealth with respects to uh, the behavioral domain, which is something I'm very close to, is Dr. David Wacker and Dr. Scott Lindgren from the University of Iowa. So as early as 1996, there were feasibility studies done to see the effectiveness of telehealth for therapy. And in 2003, there was a big pioneering study by them, and the results were such uh, that the same level of care and benefits are provided via telehealth, which is home therapy at home. The parent is the facilitator. The therapist is the person who guides the parent. And sometimes it can be even more effective, if not as effective. Parents can be taught very effectively to implement these behavior assessment techniques, these behavior intervention techniques, and it is very cost effective. Now, five general reasons for why telehealth is beneficial. Number one, improved access. In today's day and age, almost majority of the people have access to a smart gadget and internet connection. Those of us who are privileged enough to have it, we can make use of it. And so, um, it's remote learning, so it's remote online therapy, wherein the parent could be taking their child out for shopping and you're working on behavior of compliance during shopping trips. I can be a supervisor to the parent because the parent can show me what's happening by putting me on a mute and putting my video off. And that way I can see how the parent is interacting with the child. So there's improved access, it's cost efficient. I know all of you can agree that Bangalore traffic is very painstaking. It really tests all of our patients. And cost efficiency is that I don't have to travel. You don't have to travel. You can cut off the travel costs. You can cut off the travel time. And it uses a third, innovative models. The internet is a dearth of um, amazing resources, interactive gamified resources. And it makes things fun, videos, movie clips. Um, we can use the resources online to create motivation for the child. It's an improved quality, unlike before, wherein I would work directly with the child. So now I can get insight into the home environment. There are many cases, I'm sure you parents are aware, where your child is not doing what you want them to do at home, but in the sessions, they are doing exactly what they're supposed to do. And the therapist says that. And for me to get access into the home environment is for me to be able to redirect, okay, so that's why this is happening. You're not sitting properly or see the child is seeing that you're upset and that is giving them the reinforcement that they want, but it's not the positive kind of reinforcement that we're focusing on, excuse me. So it's an improved quality because it's direct intervention. Directly, I can correct the parent at home and the patient need and demand. So like an IEP, an individualized uh, educational plan that we would do at a therapy set, uh, setup or in a school setup, this can be done even through telehealth and the demands can be made. So the demands for help is way more than the supply, especially now given the coronavirus situation. But for me to cut down on travel costs, for me to be able to access uh, smart technology is for me to also be able to help many more children than I could uh, if I was at a fixed setup, uh, a fixed therapy setup. Um, so why parents? Uh, because I believe parents are the primary caregivers. They are the primary stakeholders. You spend the most number of uh, amount of time with your child. I might spend about say two to three hours per week, but the rest of the day it's you. And so why I would suggest or recommend you considering telehealth is number one, you are aware of all the nitty gritty of the therapy. Initially or previously before COVID, 
you'd come, you'd leave your child in therapy set up, you'd leave. Or you'd come, you'd be with your child while therapy was happening, but you wouldn't be constantly, not constantly, consciously aware of why this is happening, how this is happening, what are the intentions, what are the goals. Now for you to be the facilitator, because I cannot physically come and intervene, you can see therapy as a science. You can see mental health as a science. You can see why this is being implemented. What are the objectives? What could be the certain um, shortcomings, drawbacks, troubleshooting uh, protocol that you have to have in mind? So that's the nitty gritty of all the therapy. Second is being at home, you're able to strengthen the relationship that you have with your child. You can use a lot of creative methods. Creativity has no limits. So you can be as creative as you can your relationship with your child is strengthened. And many a times you might discover aspects of your child that you had not yet been aware of because you're spending so much uh, quality time with your child. And also it's as a different role, as opposed to just a parent. Now you're also a trainer or a therapist, a therapist technician or something like that. For instance, one of my clients, mom was so surprised that the child was aware of uh, wearing a mask the etiquette that goes into wearing masks and hygiene when she did not ad actively address this uh, concept with the child. This is what we discovered through a bunch of games, uh, which I would show you at the end of this. And lastly, the third point for why parents, you are now the facilitators. Therefore, whatever positive change, progress, result you see, you can take all the credit or most of the credit for it. And that itself is a source of encouragement, reward, and motivation. So um, Bertie, could I have screen share enabled? Because I'd like to show some. Yes, you can share your screen. There's a yes. thing at the bottom. Yeah. OK. So first, I'd like to start with basic rules, because now this is a video session. And like the therapy setup, we give the child expectations rules. So the first rule would be stay seated because the child has to be sitting in front of the, uh, the system. The second is turn takings. The thing about Zoom is if I'm talking and you're talking, audio is cut. The communication stream is disrupted. So take turns. The last is ask for help. This is created for a very young child, but you can modify it for an older child. You can tell the child. There are various ways of explaining these three main rules. Um, next, I would like to show you the main aspect is creating motivation. How do you create motivation online when you're not there to physically help the child? This is something I use. It was a template given by uh, Dr. Emily McCullough. She's a BCBA. So these are smiley faces. Who doesn't like smiley faces? One, two, three, four, five. So it's a token economy system of positive reinforcement five faces for five activities at the end of the uh, uh, end of the session. If the child gains those five smileys, the child can pick either a pizza game or the child can pick either feeding the animals game. So a bunch of online resources are there. And one of my favorite resources are uh, this is this thing called Boom Learning, Boom Interactive Learning. So I would like to show you that as well. So say the child has um, received all the five smileys. Next what? So we should show this. Um, this is make your own pizza. Who doesn't like pizza? I'm sure all of us like pizza. So if I was to quickly play the game, and thanks to Zoom, I can enable remote control. So the child and the parent can take control of the system we roll the dough. Next, we put the sauce. Next, we grate the cheese. And then we put all our ingredients. And finally, we make the pizza. So that's a motivation in itself for the child. And um, so to also bring about the mask etiquette that I was telling you about is this platform, wherein there's a monster. And the monster is not so scary because we want monsters to be friendly. And washing your hands, is that an acceptable practice? Is that not acceptable in terms of hygiene? So you'd say yes. The next would be putting toys. Is putting toys in your mouth safe? So this is where you enable the child to um, comprehend concepts that are very 
could be quite difficult to express verbally, but through these visual interactive modes, they can be very interesting and motivating for the child. And I have seen results as it has been evidence-based and scientifically proven through Dr. Wackel's studies and Scott Lindgren's studies that Personally, an experience was we were working on no interrupting during business calls. That was the main goal of mine, that I was working with a child. And through social stories, through videos, through um, interactive games, we came with a concept wherein quiet mouth. And last week, the parent called and she said, you know what? This child, he did not interrupt me during this business call. He said quiet mouth. And that was the first time he actually listened and the parent was so thrilled and I was able to tell the parent, this is all you, this is all you've done. So I'd like to end by saying something by Jake Marazzo. He's a DMD warrior. He says, don't live the diagnosis, live the life. And so I really encourage all of you to take up telehealth as a way to help your child. And I'm so glad to hear that in the beginning, uh, Mr. Anand said that you know what, we are starting online therapy and I truly, truly encourage all the parents to make use of this because this is effective. Yes, it does require some commitment in terms of time, but the results are so beneficial and it is safe because we cannot physically come and help you. Like I said, some intervention is better than no intervention. So I'd like to thank Team Darth again for this opportunity. And yes. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, that was very, very helpful and very, very useful. You know, for all the parents out there who are listening and who are like, I did not take notes, don't worry. She has put this all down in the newsletter, which we have made av available for everybody else. So I have just put the newsletter, the link to downloading the newsletter in the chat. You can click on it and there'll be a download PDF. You can click on it and you can get a copy of the newsletter where you have everything that JC said in a neat form, so you can use that. Uh, now is the time for the open forum discussion. Uh, Dr. Arun Shastri, if I may, can I ask you to put on your video? Uh, we would like you to come. Uh, again, let me, let me say it very clearly, we will be talking about treatment options, but we won't be allowing you to talk about it. We will not be opening up the uh, floor on video you and I can't unmute you but please put your questions in the chat there have already been lots of chat uh, questions in the chat and I know Dr. Shastri uh, has been taking uh, note of that and he will be uh, try, he'll try to answer as many of your questions as possible so Dr. Shastri is here yes and I shall see myself out of this. And Dr. Shastri, you but have a chat? Yeah. Just before starting this, actually, some of the questions are all related to the clinical topic. So okay. Actually, uh, I think I can do the session after the clinicians are done. That is Dr. Ann Matthew, Dr. Renu, and Dr. Andoni. So we'll keep my thing at Dr. the end. Dr. Verma is also there. Yes. If you don't, if that's fine. Meet the doctors, we will put this thing in the uh, last part of the conference. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, if, so this again goes out to everyone. Uh, as Dr. Shastri said, he has gone through all your questions and he believes that they will be answered in the next session, which is where, uh, I mean, the next session is physiotherapy. After that is a session on clinical uh, clinical program and we have Dr. Andoni, Dr. Aishi Verma, Dr. Agnes Matthew, Dr. Renu Sutar and Dr. Sartek Kamak talking to us and he believes that they will be able to answer all your questions. So we will have him back with you at the end of that session. Um, but now it's time to call Doc, uh, call Vishnu Vardhan Reddy, our resident physiotherapist. He will give a small talk, a quick talk uh, about physiotherapy and active physiotherapy and why what we follow in that is active physiotherapy. Uh, Vishnu, uh, can I have you on board, please? Is Vishnu here? Vishnu, sir? Uh, is Suresh here, uh, Dr. Suresh from Chennai? If Dr. Suresh is here, uh, I would request you to switch on your video, please. And uh, we can uh, start with the physiotherapy session in that case. Oh, there is Vishnu, sir. Hello, Vishnu, sir. One second, I'm just unmuting you. Yeah, yes. Hello? Yeah, we can hear you. Hello, good morning, good afternoon. Yes. 
go forward uh, vishnu we can hear you yeah good afternoon to all the participants who are in this online uh, uh, seminar program and uh, this part i am this work with this app for a couple of years and i uh, just to share some of the, the, the physiotherapy part of it how much we can do in this shin and uh, but is really my ah uh, yes sir i can play my uh, powerpoint okay sir uh, can you just give an introduction i will put up the ppt in 2 minutes can you just introduce what we do in that in studio yeah, yeah. Yeah, my name is Vishwanand Reddy. I'm working as a physiotherapist with uh, uh, with DAR for a couple of years. I'm also working with uh, as a therapist, uh, physiotherapist, physiotherapist at Society of Karnataka. And we have been uh, the day we started from the scratch, almost started in some six seven years down the line, where we started just with Aran and uh, and as to that, and he was the first per he was the first EM patient and I've been learned a lot with him, where we have been literally been with him, and um, and it's been a long process. We have been in the dark in because we have just uh, missed what the type of things we have there, and we have everything been thing one by cross everything and keeply keep on updating of with all our protocols what how to do, and uh, and the upgrading of treatment technique and assess. Techniques and uh, management technique, everything keep updating away, and there is a lot of support from the staff and uh, other and the board members and uh, um, other well wishers have been supporting that. Have been quite in especially in give some uh, idea to the therapy at that why because it's very very new. When I got the uh, as a consult to the uh, at the that. And and we there been working in um, uh, post COVID. I've been working daily with all the safety measures. I've been working uh, daily one children. Uh, so the, the the number of children been little bit come before the before uh, COVID. Now the children bit coming up, and uh, we have been uh, focusing very with safety safety measures. We've been doing the therapy gram. Uh, we daily one or two children have been taking it down. And the thing I want to tell you is that what the therapy, what is the therapy we have been doing at the dart, and what is the treatment, and what's the um, the rehabilitation process like for the children at dart. Okay. But you please find PPT. So you can start, sir. Just tell next slide. I will go to the next slide. Yeah. yeah next slide. Yeah. Just have to mention really the the basic from the part of uh, the life of everything. Some child will be in some children wheelchair, and uh, because patients have been treated to so much service and before, and they would have come up. They also would have a lot of knowledge to the other place. And, Through the internet and the thing, and come with a lot of uh, questions, a lot of uh, hopes, like and then something the thing it takes time for the better child and the therapist at that here because already there have been so many hospitals and the therapist would have something and because they would have been sent the baby there. And uh, then there is no option available for parents as of because. So much of this is available in the net and everywhere. At the top, we are doing basically we have a we have done the the calling and the child comes. We are we are entering the child. Um, we are testing the child and uh, to make it uh, 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 different to the parents so they can check on the directly in the registration in the online. And uh, and and enroll for the other patient. And what we are at the heart is when they will come generally. There are types of generally uh, the main major the children we see is the uh, muscular atrophy. In addition, the DMD we even say back muscular atrophy and uh, 
name grid difficult display and all of the display which are various computer dmd dmd is a measure to measure the display what we see that and what we do what we are trying to do here is we are trying to develop standard assessment uh, protocol and the standard things have been allowed uh, it's been wide accepted uh, Whole world or any of the place where that is been functioning like uh, like where it has been done. Generally, what doing yeah that what we are uh, trying to we are physical assessment and physical assessment in the subjective and the first is the see the child walking whether the child in the wheelchair the child able to. Uh, uh, such as to like how we are talking and all that the key the different skills what you journey and standard skills what will presently follow the dial will be the not stumbled assessment groups and we know in the motor changer in classrooms can have with functional skill and rest assessment just to mention of this these are all the standard uh, and the stand scale that you were and also that been written to us to flow at the which is that okay just to mention about obviously it's a bit and uh, the not as the previous slide the previous slide the not a related assessment is in between which is done to the board related we then will is able to walk and so the was all because and all the symptom is in general you know, after the years of search and it's not standard to get done for the late children until the child uh, like the child is able to walk how he is able to sit to stand how the child is able to uh, climb the stairs okay like and and, and and both the child is able to balance himself on this all to like the right able to and much basis able to stand whether just in the chair is able to stand please in certain things and how the child is able to uh uh general like uh we have landed uh, equipment to be followed like uh, step tool and how they able to climb the stool and be able to bend the stool and how is able to uh, raise head with in the group point this will hold the inline is the uh, style action okay or is a header now and how child is able to uh, from being and how the child is able to rise to the foot and and the child is able to stand and the child is able to walk able to run and able to jump and these are all the things which in the world instead in the ambulatory and it is not so really uh, there are like a two eyes which are being said is the time called a time to time is from the floor the child allowed eyes the child is made eyes fine and i ask him take him to stand the time the number of times take time to from point to handing the number of times we are able to measure it it use out measure it will use some key program of the uh, progress of this and and one more is also how the and uh, in sense landing walking even the thing is for bested for meters and this one we have recorded as a time and this is not ambulatory this is right in the period uh, must be which who are able who are ambulatory and brooks is normally the scale has been for limitation generally a child is able to lift both hands so the child is able to uh, bring his hand more to um, hold the glass water to the mouth okay and how the two forms have been lost and uh, how the child is able to as a child is the child not, is not able to bring his hands to the mouth uh, at least he is able to write or even uh, pick up any from the table or there is no uh, any other function that our in the world and there is so the process the easily the, the child be able to it is so and so and okay in the full of the full section or else in the six is where it is then six you can tell is whether the child able to there is no any other thing is available in the arms 
and the no scale is the which is able to trace the lower limb motion whether it is able to climb the stairs and how we climb the stairs that is to climb with um, support without support and that is able to, to stand and how scale is the child able to wait for the roof support whether the child is to land long braces or else the child is wheelchair or red and all this has been this means generally it is a test that is a scale being used of the Uh, for the MD to assess lower limb motion, we can generally measure from two to ten. The one generally uh, is able to climb the stairs up, asking a descending stairs as plan with any support. And then the normally the the upper part of the way the child is uh, feel in the front front bed. Uh, Vishnu and, sir, uh, I'm really sorry. I think there's yeah. some uh, uh, internet issues on your end. Uh, your audio is not coming through properly. Okay, so what we will do is yeah, uh, louder. Uh, no, sir. I think it's internet issues. What I would suggest you do is uh, you uh, leave Zoom, okay, and then uh, switch off your. Are you on Wi-Fi or are you on uh, GPRS, sir? Uh, Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi. Uh, okay, sir. Uh, Wi-Fi. I would uh, because the audio is really tough for us to follow. Do one thing. I will go to Doctor Suresh. We will talk to Doctor Suresh. and then i'll come back and if it's clear then we'll continue okay sir i'll just ask dr suresh to step in and then we'll continue after that thank you sir Hello. yeah ha ah, i will call you back i will talk to dr suresh and call you back just switch off your wifi and come back sir i think the internet should catch up by then yeah yeah uh ladies and gentlemen sorry about that we have some technical difficulties uh which is not surprising uh i would like to ask dr suresh from uh, chennai Uh, uh one of the first physiotherapists that that and pretty much the uh the man behind the synergy system to come online and uh, i like to uh, invite dr suresh to come on uh, say a few words so yeah so can you please start your video please hello yes you able to hear me yes sir you good yeah. sir yeah. good afternoon everyone uh, thanks uh, for uh, thanks and congratulations to dot for holding this international conference a needy conference and you know almost all the experts in the different lines are included in this it will be good for uh, like you know people to share their experiences in bringing a good uh, like no turning point in the management of children with the duchenne muscular dystrophy my my talk is a very big talk but i do not want to like no take off the important session i just want to be brief in 10 minutes what are what is the advances what is the present management of uh, like no children with the dmd but is it possible for you to for me to share my slides yes sir i have given you share screen there's a uh-huh. button at the bottom you can use that to show sir Second oh, oh. button. Yes, sir. So share screen, and you can choose what you want to share, the PPT or the video. You can just choose, and you can play it, or you can just PPT with it. Yeah. So share, share, share. Like, I can just share. How much? Yes, sir. Okay. At and the I bottom, have... there should be a green color up arrow. You can just press share screen, share. and choose what you want to share. Yeah, we are good. Okay, important. You can see your desktop, sir. Yeah, is that okay? Perfect. Yes, sir. Okay. <clears throat> so, physiotherapy input is very essential for the maintenance of muscle function in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. <clears throat> the main goal of treatment is to slow the disease progression, control the secondary complications like uh, tightness, respiratory issue, cardiac issue. and also the main focus is to improve the quality of life of the patients and the carers <clears throat> vishnu will be telling in detail about the various evaluation with regard to neuromuscular assessment evaluation plays a major role we have set up uh, like there are a lot of evaluation available these are the prime important evaluation we do two thing is it has advantage to like you know whether uh, whatever treatment they were on some t- some kids will be benefited out of steroids some kids may not be some kids the opportunity that akarun shastri also is going to come out with the new molecule 
in any other medical condition there are a lot of blood tests to find out whether that medicine is working or not in muscular dystrophy alone the main primary outcome is the physical measures whatever medicine they gave in order to know whether the disease is uh, like no that medicine is improving it is in a status quo or progressing these are all the various tests to be performed so the main goals of physiotherapy is to maintain range of movement and to maintain the symmetry at a different joint to maintain the best function and also to prevent the deformities and also aid in standing and walking so what are all the various physiotherapy options available for a child with the dmd worldwide even though there are a lot of school of thought about strengthening forcing the child to walk forcing the child to do lot of activities the main four things what you have to do regularly is stretching range of motion exercise in the form of uh, endurance positioning them in a correct uh, in an anatomical position and also the breathing exercise when when uh, when you take a child with the cerebral palsy and other neuromuscular disease there are a lot of uh, like no aim we have to set in how to improve how to bring the uh, like you know milestone when the child to be uh, sit when 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 to make the child to stand and walking but with regard to muscular dystrophy any exercise if you give in when if the exercise is too much it will have adverse effect it will start like weakening the muscle any individual if you go to a gym do exercise muscle will damage and it will get replaced because you normal people got good amount of dystrophin which helps in getting the muscle bulk back in the case of child with the dmd as there is a problem with the dystrophin you have to be very careful in giving exercise the, the main ideal and recommended exercise is stretching when when the child walk when the child do a lot of activity what happen one group of muscle which is responsible for keeping the child in upright position when there is a constant influence of gravity that muscle will go for uh, like you no know, early weakness to compensate that weakness opposite muscle will work too hard there so that is a reason stretching plays a major role to maintain the optimal function otherwise what happened like a seesaw one guy is strong one guy is weak ultimately what happened the guy who is strong the uh, thing will go down no same thing the child will develop st uh, start developing contraction and tightness so main thing is the stretching and the positioning the effective stretching it de depends on the combination of followed by stretching active assisted stretching and then you position them with using a splint orthosis or standing devices so what are all the common places you have to stretch one is stretching the hip flexors the muscle which is responsible for taking the hip up and the side muscle iliotibial hamstring muscle which is prone for tightness normally most of the child they started walking in toe that plantar flexors will be very tight so plantar flexors to be stretched tibial is posterior tibial is and the toe flexors to be stretched at a regular interval in the case of upper extremity these child started developing bending elbow closed fingers the main muscles to be focused here are elbow flexors pronators long wrist muscle finger extensor lumbricals thumb and palm musculature so that the child will be in a good anatomical position the other next uh, other stretches to stretch the neck extensor and also the rib cage mobility because this child with weak muscle it used to, the child will develop like you no know, curvature in the spine as a result then if you see most of the child once when they sit in the bed or in the chair there will be like you know the spine will be bent to one position to avoid that simple stretches to maintain this spine is also very useful for them and once when the stretching is done whatever stretches you do to maintain that muscle function what you need to do is to do basic endurance exercise endurance exercise when you when, when you perform any endurance exercise for your child see to that you do normal anatomical movements without giving any resistance if you give resistance as i said again there is a damage in the muscle which will not replace as a muscle tissue it will replace as a fibrous tissue as a result and your child will lose the muscle power and end up end up with deformity and tightness there are certain centers wherein when they give very strenuous exercise uh, making the child who is who has a potential to walk to become a non ambulant so try to follow the recommended exercise by your center physiotherapist and they let you not overdo anything that is not good for child with the duchenne muscular dystrophy 
the most common thing of many child many parents comes mm -hmm. to us is like you no know, when the child is stand it stands with the excessive curvature in the spine it is not a problem because as i told once when the muscle is put into lot of action muscle will go for weakness to compensate that only that the tilt, pel pelvic bone will go little forward anterior tilt we used to say as a result then the child develop excess curvature many centers they start doing lot of abdomen exercise to compensate that that is 100% not advisable when you will see one thing is like you know what physiotherapy we give is to maintain the muscle power it is not the treatment for a muscle child the treatment lies with the doctor uh, neurologist and arun shastri and other scientific expert who are coming out with some definite molecule for the treatment but as a physiotherapist we are trying to maintain the muscle power and slow the disease progression never try to treat scoliosis the one main thing what you need to follow is follow your neurologist prescription on how to take the steroid take it correctly don't have a myth about steroid your doctor know how to give when to give how much to give you follow that strictly and as far as possible try to make the child stand that is the most important thing don't do lot of abdomen exercise so the, when 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 it comes to treatment doctor treat with the corticosteroid stretching exercise splint and the prolongation of walking and standing is the only recommended treatment now when as the time is short i'm i'm going to stress on only four aspect one is stretching endurance and most commonly this child develop a lot of pulmonary issues as they grow older earlier we were not clear what are all the issues they used to get as they grow older but thanks to university of california davis which helped us in doing a five year study on the natural history of the disease then we were in a position to find out what what changes happening at what what uh, ages based on that we have some guidelines when to perform a pulmonary function test when to perform a respiratory muscle strength to start with as the child grows to you, you need not give incentive spirometer and force the child to do too much if again when you when they do too much of incentive spirometer that also weakens the respiratory muscle be be minimal with the resp uh, like you know uh, incentive spirometer maybe 5 to 7 repetitions when the child get up in the morning encourage the child to blow out with a balloon or a whistle or whatever it may be that will help in removing the excess carbon dioxide and breathing exercise to maintain the lung elasticity at the moment there are a lot of uh, like you know adjuncts available to maintain the lung elasticity one is called uh, uh, one is called this uh, breath stacking device what we normally recommend for a child as the child grows with weak muscle the child may not be in a position to expand the lung properly what we have to do we have to inflate the lung as if like just like we inflate air in the tire and the balloon this single valve ambu bag helps it maintains the lung elasticity so that the child can take more amount of air when possible now next is like you know this this incentive spirometer as i said you don't give too uh, like you know many repetitions maybe 5 to 7 repetitions two or three times a day too much of incentive spirometry also will affect the child respiratory muscle earlier many many centers they used to give this pep device this is called acapella positive expiratory pressure with the flutter which helps in removing the secretion but this is not the choice now as i said when they do forcible exercise with the resistance again they are going to waste their like you no know, weaken the respiratory muscles which may give like you no know, side effect so try to avoid this we what like you know to set up for some goal to know about how the child is improving with uh, uh, like you know different options available from steroid to exon skipping this is the baseline walk test 6 minute walk test we do to know about how many how, uh, like how many meters the child could cover in 6 min 6 minute with the intervention we will see whether the child has improved the uh, distance or there is a deterioration in the condition then we have to think about what to do what are all the ways and means to improve the child uh, distance this is a 6 minute walk test will reveal and what we do as the child grow because of the steroid and because of the weak respiratory muscle child may not be in a position to take the carbon dioxide out as a result then the child used to develop ahi sleep apnea that is a risky thing what uh, what is recommended now once when the child touches 12 when the when the parents say no night time the, my child is snoring morning when they get up severe headache is there and it is not the child mood swing is there then you have to check with your physician neurologist and ask for a 
uh, overnight sleep study overnight sleep study will uh, like you know help us sorry overnight sleep study will help us like you know whether the child is having too much of uh, like you know carbon dioxide retention whether the respiratory muscle is weak in that case with your doctor recommendation we have to go for a non invasive ventilation like a bipap which will improve the respiratory quality of the child life this is the other gadget available in the market called the cough assist device as the winter season is started normal individual when you have a sputum or whenever you have secretion in the lung you, with your good cough effort you can spit it out but as the child grows when the muscles which is responsible for bringing the secretion is weak then you have to contemplate this cough assist device maybe what i would suggest for my children in the winter season at least once or twice let them come to a center using a separate mask and a filter they can have this cough assist device which help in opening the lung as well as it will try to bring out the secretion which is there in the lung this is one of the best device what like you no know, we found useful for children with the duchenne muscular dystrophy once when they have weak cough to bring the secretions out so when with regard to pulmonary issue what i we suggest is to positioning them in a dysnic uh, minimizing position and uh, lung volume recruitment as i said that uh, ambu bag which helps in expanding the lung and when the child has issues in breathing then you have to contemplate this non invasive ventilation like a bipap and cough assist device when the child is having difficulty in bringing the secretion out the these are all the recommended portion which i as the time is short i'll uh, like no pass this to berti you'll be in a portion to uh, like no post you in the uh, you know in the dart website or in the uh, in the youtube attachment it will be if at all any now you can just send a mail through uh, to to berti you'll be in a portion to call, uh, communicate with me and we will try to fix your problem and with regard to chest physiotherapy breathing exercise to ensure that the child is using the respiratory muscle properly without any resistance if at all the child develop any secretion position them so that gravity will assist in draining the secretion whatever get accumulated in the lung assisted coughing one is like you know what we do like you know we teach the child to do glossopharyngeal breathing that is one type of breathing when the respiratory muscles are weak with open glottis the child uh, like you no know, child need to do this glossopharyngeal breathing as if like you no know, it, it is it is otherwise called as like you no know, dog breathing or frog breathing the child has to keep on utter the word gap 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 which doesn't involve too much of respiratory muscle it helps in uh, like you know the glossopharyngeal muscle will help in expanding the lung take the take more oxygen to the lung and a breath stacking device helps this is a glossopharyngeal breathing breathing to like you no know, expand the lung to some extent so we have lot of like you no know, benchmark how to when to use this cough assist device uh, when with with uh, like you no know, periodic lung function test and with the periodic respiratory muscle strength we also measure periodic peak cough flow or uh, pefr we used to say which is which normally they use for uh, copd patient to check the peak expiratory flow that also helps us like to know about the strength of the respiratory muscle whenever it goes below 160 liter per minute then we have to contemplate like you know is there any other like cough assist device helps for the child to bring out the secretion and this is the way we give this cough assist device and the bipap as i said when the child develop like you know a breathing difficulty headache then bivalvular airway pressure your physician will be in a portion to help in doing the setting how much uh, like you no know, rate how much inspiratory pressure how much uh, expiratory pressure to be set based upon the uh, sleep uh, uh, sleep study as well as your uh, abg report and the x-ray report when, it, when indications also as i said like when there is a fatigue breathing difficulty morning and day sleep dysfunction when the child has difficulty in concentration physiologically when they do abg when the uh, a percentage of psco2 is more than 45 when the saturation is dropping below 88 when the functional vital capacity is less than 50% when the maximum inspiratory pressure is less than 60 those are all the indications for the child to go to bipap you need not wait the child to develop symptom after 12 you ensure the child is getting pulmonary function test with your physician advice if you have all the, if the child develop other symptoms ensure the child is has to undergo once a year sleep study so that you can prevent a lot of like you no know, other adverse effect because of uh, 
this uh, sleep issues. And uh, sometimes many of the of our children are uh, like, you know, once when we found the child has got a sleep apnea with other measurement, we give them nocturnal ventilation so that the child, uh, like, you know, concentration, child endurance, child participation also improves. And the next most important thing, as I said, for DMD, only four things you need to know. Rose, R is respiratory, O is orthotics, S is stretching, and E is endurance exercise. I have discussed about respiratory. What, I'm just going to tell the take home only. Don't give too much of spirometry, no resistant exercise, positioning them, lung volume recruitment, periodically monitor them with the proper respiratory, like you know, pulmonary function test, respiratory muscle stretch, as and when needed, sleep study. And with regard to uh, stretching, I have told what are all the muscle, muscles to be stretched. And with regard to endurance exercise, I told how many repetition without giving any resistance, 10 to 20 repetition, all the anatomical movements, your physiotherapist will be in a position to help you. Then the most important thing is orthotics. Many people uh, think that like, no, my child is walking on the toes. If I give a L-shape angle in the ankle, the child will walk better. But it is a compensatory mechanism. For the weak thigh muscle, your child is walking on the toe. If you give that L-shape mechanism to, keep your to, uh, to make your child walk better, the child will ultimately lose his ambulation. Orthotics is mainly given to provide stability and mostly it has to be tried only when the child is at rest or during the night times. Never try orthotics when the child during the morning hour when the child is active. When you try to stabilize a joint, the child will lose the ambulation at the earliest. So different orthotics, what, what are the different orthotics available is one is ankle foot orthosis we used to say to keep the ankle in good position. Once when the hamstring muscle, the muscle which is at the back of the thigh gets more tighter, the child will have difficulty in standing. So in that time, even though you are not motivated, you are not aiming to ambulate the child, at least standing definitely helps the child to get the bone stronger to maintain the muscle in good optimal position. What I would suggest is you can use knee ankle foot orthosis when the child started uh, developing weak thigh muscle, but the strong back of the thigh muscle, hamstring muscle. And when the walking is no longer possible, then what, what are all the options you have? One is like, you know, provision of appropriate wheelchair. As I said, the stretching exercise, because to accommodate the child in wheelchair, muscles to be in a normal anatomical position. And splints and orthotic devices, pulmonary and the spinal support, if the spine goes for too much of bending, unfortunately in our country with this climate, very difficult for the child to develop, uh, use the spinal support throughout. The best thing is try to be very, 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 very strict with your doctor medication. If you do proper medication, proper stretching, the possibility of developing spinal curvature is less. Most, as in our, uh, like, you know, in, I mean, uh, like any child, the maximum bone growth will be between 14 and 16 years. If you could able to provide proper support till to 14 to 16 years with the proper medication, proper physiotherapy, proper seating, the possibility of going for the spinal curvature is very, very minimal. Once when the child attains 60, the extent of going uh, like not too much of bending is not going to be like you know, as bad as when you start promoting the child to develop a uh, deformity in the, between, between uh, like you know, 11 and 15. So as I said, night spins to slow the development. There are op options on knee foot orthosis, ankle foot orthosis, wheelchair available. Never ever try orthotics in the daytime, which is not good. Okay, so the, in, I, I have just discussed in brief about this because this is a very extensive topic to run for at least half a day. I want to give you four main instructions. One is positioning, stretching, endurance, pulmonary management, and a proper orthotics. This, if, 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 if I can be able to reach this so four information to you, that is more than enough for us for this conference. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Um, it has, it, we, we understand the implications when you say it has to be a long pick. And as Sir correctly pointed out, we will have all the videos and everything online in the website. And Sir, you can uh, put the link to it and we'll take you through. A second, you. you stop the screen share, sir. Uh, next, we'd like to call Dr. Ann Agnes Matthew, um, who is from, uh, who is what, one of the, Topmost uh, clinicians who we are working 
with and she's from Bangalore Baptist Hospital and uh, first of all, uh, my apologies to her for the delay that we, we have been uh, experiencing. Uh, sir, can you just stop share at the bottom? There'll be a stop share uh, option. Yeah. And I'd like to call uh, ma'am to come forward and say a few words. Yes, ma'am. Uh, ma'am? Hold on one second, ma'am. You should have got a small thing saying asked one. Yes, we are good. You sure? Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Bertie. Thank you, Dr. Anand. Uh, I mean, Mr. Anand and family. Thank you to uh, Dr. Arun Shastri and all the DART members. And uh, congratulations to all of you for having made it to this day. I think we live in exciting times and uh, people like all our DMD children and the families, all of you listening to it, you are the ones who give us the courage to go forward. I think it should be a mutual thing and we encourage each other. Um, so I saw some of the questions, they're really great questions and I agree with Dr. Arun, if we can keep the questions towards the end because many of the questions would be uh, hopefully answered by the end of the talk. Um, I, I'm, uh, I was asked to talk on the uh, care of heart, uh, of the cardiac care in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Am I audible, Mr. Bertie? Am I audible? Yes, ma'am, you are, ma'am, and you can see the screen as well. Thank you. So, because most of the topics are covered, so I shall not go into the realm of somebody else's topic. Um, so, starting off, so as we all know, dystrophin is a protein that is expressed in muscle, but its uh, heart is also a muscle, just that it is a slightly different structural muscle. The skeletal muscles are all like tubes, so they contract, but the heart is like a lattice, it's like a network and they contract too. And then, but, the, but we should remember that the history of DMD is changing. 30, 40 years ago, maybe what we still see in some parts of our developing nation is still uh, children who live till 14, 18 years of age. That is not our history. That is not the legacy that our children have. Even before the cures, that exciting cures that um, people at DART and various other places are finding out, the natural history is changing. There's a lot of differences to your people are living till their fourth and fifth decade. So the main, main problem in how the heart is involved is there is membrane, the heart is, is a muscle. Each of the cells, they are like a membrane, they contract and they're instable. So you end up having small injuries at the cellular level, which is at the microscopic level. So what uh, simplistically put, this mimics or imitates uh, like a heart attack, small, small heart attack, small things are happening and small amounts of tissue in the heart are getting damaged without our being aware of it. So the, and the tissue that is like anything in the body, if you have a cut, the cut heals. And if it's a deep cut, it's replaced by scar tissue. Scar tissue is what we call in medical term, we call it fibrosis. So that's what happens to our children in the back of their calf, in the leg, at the back of their calf, you see that their calves are really bulky, they're firm, and they are, they're, they're, they're full of fibrous tissue. So that's what happens to the heart. Only the heart is inside, so we can't see it. So because of better breathing care, respiratory care, everything is changing. But this is really important. Cardiac care is lagging behind. So invariably, almost all, 100%, all children, heart is involved. And what happens is that previously they were, you know, weakness was killing them or respiratory care was, uh, was, was a major uh, threat to their life. But now because, so even the new medicines that we're talking about, the newer therapies, they, they don't target the heart per se. So that's our next, next goal. We have one goal, we reach the goal, then we have another goal, the next goal. So as we said, this is just to remind all of us that among all the various people that are even in today's program, you have various, um, uh, you know, stalwarts from all over India, as well as from people from abroad. All these people are specialists in one particular area. I'm a specialist in neurology, uh, not with the heart, but cardiac involvement in Duchenne is something that we deal with every day, so I can speak about it, but not manage it all the time. But this is to remind us that the person in the middle is the child and the family, and each of it has got a role. Each of these specialists have a role, but the main role is still corticosteroid, because till we get a main treatment. And I'm, I'm not going to go into it because Dr. Renu Sutar will very ably describe that because that's a very important topic. So dystrophin gene, we all know protein is produced and membrane stability, this is the skeletal muscle. So this is the complex, but the same thing is there in the heart as well. So this is, it, it works like a shock absorber. 
So this is a normal heart, just to give us an idea. You have your right heart, which has the impure blood, and you have the left heart, which has the pure blood. This red one is a high pressure system. So the walls will be thicker, and the right side is a low pressure system. So your main, why this is a high pressure system is the right, the left heart has to pump with such force that it has to go, the blood that is pumped has to go to all the parts of the body. So it is a high pressure system. Whereas the right side has to pump blood only to the lungs. So the pressure is not that much, the pressure needed or needed to generate is not that much. So what happens here, initially what we see is that the heart is there, slowly, slowly there is fibrosis. You may not see any changes. Initially as clinicians, as, phys as doctors, what we see is there may be subtle, simple changes with ECG. For us, for example, uh, heart rate in a, in a baby is different. In different ages of childhood, it is different. But often what we see, the very early sign is when we check the pulse, the pulse of a child who's affected with Duchenne muscular dystrophy, we see that their heart rate is often higher. This might be our early warning sign. Through ECG itself, we can make out things. And then slowly what happens is, uh, like if you go back to this, your heart is pumping. You have the top part, the, uh, the upper, upper vessels, they pump then the vessels relax. The whole of the chambers of the heart relax. In relaxation, it is called diastole. So the heart is filling. And then when the heart is actively pumping, it is systole. So what happens is, in diastole, when the heart is relaxing, there is some minimal abnormalities. That's the next step of abnormality. This is the sequence of how weakness develops. So we know how children's weakness physically develops you know, with the legs and it starts getting worse. This is what happens inside the heart that something that we can't see. Then, then comes... You know, at the cellular level, you may have fibrosis, the scar tissue forming. That is not picked up on, um, on that is not picked up on images, on scans, or even if it's even if it's MRI, you may not pick up the small things. You can't take a biopsy from the heart and check for it. So this is why we are we have different tools to pick it up as early as possible because that means you can change the history of the child. Then, then what happens is all of the chambers of the heart, including the atrium and the ventricles, all of them become dilated. By this time, it's already getting late. Things are reaching a, a bad stage. Then you have systolic dysfunction, meaning the heart. So even if the heart is all enlarged, it will still struggle and still pump. So the pumping activity, which is the main function of the heart, will still continue. That is systolic, systolic function. The next step of development of abnormality is where the systole is impaired. And after that comes end-stage heart failure. So we have lots of stages before which we can intervene. So this is just to demonstrate that. And uh, many muscular dystrophies, including Duchenne and Becker, follow the same trajectory. It's important to notice that Duchenne children are the ones we see with a lot of physical weakness. Our Becker children who, are very, who have very minimal weakness, I will never forget this is, a family. this is a family that I had while I was training in the UK. We had two siblings. Uh, they were both Paralympic swimmers. They won the gold medal. But one of them ended up needing, uh, he was walking, running, doing everything. Physical activity was very good but his heart was weak enough that he ended up with cardiac failure and he was on a waiting list for a cardiac transplant. So the whole point is that we avoid these things. So our newer therapies, this is to, just to point out, all our newer therapies, Exxon Dis, Vito Larsen, the newer, newer Exxon skipping therapies, they do have some manifestation in the heart, but it is not effective enough to change the, the history of what happens to the heart. So this is to remind all of us, 2018 guidelines, these are the guidelines that we are all over the world following with regards to cardiac care, physiotherapy, bone health, how do we give the steroids, everything. So this paper in part two of this volume, the part two, this, is, this, in, this is mentions nicely about the cardiac care. So again, coming to, this is taken from the same document saying MDT, most important part. No one individual or no one specialist is important. And that is why when, when I've noticed some of the parents asking, can we give this drug? Can we give Ramipril? Can we give Etabler, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, some, uh, some other medicines like Glozartin or Carvedilol or Pirindopril and all those things. It's, it's not so, so simple. It is taken in the context of that whole child and all the other problems that the child has. So we are, we are speaking only about cardiac today. So why is this difficult? Because um, often with elderly people or, or middle-aged people, suddenly somebody has a heart attack. You know the symptoms. As lay people, you don't need to be a medic to know that they get chest pain or often be, you know, swallowing difficulties and radiating pain to the hands. Unfortunately, our children with DMD don't have any of these symptoms, mainly because what happens is they have something similar to a heart attack and often it's a chronic slow damage. 
So often it happens when somebody is walking or exerting themselves. Dramatically, we see in movies that somebody gets a shocking news and then they get a heart attack. Why is this happening? The heart is pumping. That's not always the case, but heart is pumping and the blood supply is not enough. So one part of the heart is saying, hey, I'm in pain, I'm in trouble, I'm dying, and you get pain. But this doesn't happen because our children with DMD are not exerting themselves. They're not walking. So often, they only, only when they're in end stage often, they will get symptoms like, very often we see this, suddenly children or families come and say they're losing weight. For the last 20 days, there is no appetite. They have flushed face or they're feeling vague discomfort or feeling fear. So often the fear is a vague feeling in the, in the, in the, in the front of your chest, which is difficult to describe. Sometimes they have nausea, may not be actual vomiting, palpitations. Some children have palpitations, but often children lack the vocabulary to tell us that they have palpitations. The, you know, feeling your heart beat. So, so this is why it, it, you, you do need to screen. So high index of suspicion and knowing the natural history is the key here. So children with cardiac, uh, um, children's heart in Duchenne muscle dystrophy, they have both rhythm abnormality. Your heart, uh, uh, the muscle in the heart has got a particular, uh, there's a pathway, it's like an electrical circuitry, which tells the heart, okay, first two chambers, you, you contract, you relax, then the next two chambers contract. So there's a pattern to it. This pattern is what generates the ECG tracing. Children with DMD often have, uh, along with the scarring, the scarring also involves these electrical tissue and they have rhythm abnormalities. They need to be screened for these rhythm abnormalities. So this is with annual review. So we do ECG and sometimes we do continuous ECG for 24 hours. You do echo, but a normal echo will not pick up abnormalities. So they need a functional echo. This is time and again, even in our own center, the last one and a half years, we found out that if we did an echo, a normal echo, the last one and a half years, we've been very ag aggressive with echoes. And we found that children as young as four to five years of age, we were picking up echo, echo abnormalities, early signs, where one and a half years ago, when we did not do the functional studies, we were not picking it up. So this is all advantage for us, that we can treat our children early before they land in complications. So the current consensus is that uh, we do know that children with certain mutations tend to have more cardiac abnormalities than the other, but this is not yet that very well known. So uh, this is accumulated knowledge, but that even if your echo and everything is normal, by the time you reach 10 years of age, the current guideline uh, advice is to put them on ACE1 inhibitors, angiotensin converting enzyme in inhibitors. So often early taking care of your chest, your breathing problem will also help in keeping your, because heart and lungs are, are quite closely connected. It will prevent, it will help you maintain good heart health. So early scoliosis care as well, because if your spine is bent, so hopefully many of our children don't have scoliosis care. This is a good indicator of whether we are taking care of our DMD children well. In Western countries and in, and in centers where early good management of children with the DMD is taking place, they don't end up with scoliosis badly, usually not. So this is also a good indicator. In Western countries by 2000, 2010 itself, the, uh, the incidence of scoliosis just came down very dramatically because of good care. So that's another indicator. So cardiac care should be extended to asymptomatic. This, this is a very important point. Many of our mothers and other family members may have no symptoms, but they're asymptomatic carriers, uh, asymptomatic carriers. And the asymptomatic carriers have a study shows that as high as 47%, uh, one study shows that they have 47% cardiac involvement. So this also may uh, save lives and they may, you, you often get a family history when you take family histories suddenly some uh, female member of the family dropped uh, dropped dead with a heart attack or something like that and they didn't realize because women are traditionally thought to not have get heart attack that often so again uh, unlike in dmd children we say very very often annual screening the these uh, uh, people who are asymptomatic carriers women and other people we suggest that they get once in three years ca carrier status checked with echo and functional studies so this is a good video, which I would advise all of you, all of the parents to see if you can do. It's done by the UPPMD website. It's a parent project, muscular dystrophy website. It's only one and a half minutes. It nicely says, sums up in one and a half uh, minutes in a cartoon form, everything that we've spoke about, spoken about and what is important. So the pediatric cardiologist or a cardiologist specializing with muscle care plays a key role here. Often we give first line, most of us as pediatric neurologists, we are, because we also see this early, early enough before referring them to a cardiologist, we will start perindopril. And most children tolerate it very well. Some children don't. They very occasionally, some children get cough and then we go on to Rosatin. But this is our first line management. When it comes to second line, often you can give beta adrenergic blocker, aramipril, the choices are very large. But this 
is chosen by the specialist. I won't choose it even if I know the drugs, mainly because the card I know the uh, I know how how and when to give steroids very well. The same way the cardiologist knows best about these things. Because say for example, if you talk about carbidolol, it has beta adrenergic blockade. But the reason it is chosen is also because sometimes it also improves. Uh, the way the muscles are refashioned in the heart as well. And also, they often have rhythm abnormalities. So they would have to choose between, is it going to impair the rhythm abnormality? Sometimes it causes a drop in blood pressure. So an ideal agent has to be chosen for that child. And that has to be taken, in, uh, uh, taking into, that is done, taking into account all the various factors of the heart, cardiac care of that child. So that's it. I, I, I would hope that all of you go and see this video if you can. Thank you so much, ma'am. That was a very, very good. Can I stop screen? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. You can. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you for taking time off your busy schedule. Uh, Hello, Dr. Renu. Yes, we have coming up Dr. Renu and Dr. I.C. Verma as well. Uh, uh, any information that ma'am has shared, uh, we will also be ensuring that everybody has access to it. Uh, we will make it sure that it's available either on the website or through any social media. Uh, Dr. Reno is here from PGMAR. So thank you, ma'am, for joining us and thank you for taking time of your busy schedule. Uh, I will pass on the floor to her and she will now take over. Ma'am, it's yours. Is it fine? Yes, ma'am. We can see. Yeah. Thank you. So thank you, Varti, as well as thank you, Dr. Anand and Dr. Shastri for this amazing virtual conference and uh, allowing me to speaking here regarding Dushan. Uh, I think today we have this uh, Dushan World Awareness Day and this motto of today is that together we are stronger. So I really want to say that parents, doctors, scientists, Together, if we work, then we can have good uh, research, good outcomes for our children. So with that, I'll start my uh, uh, session today that is on steroid therapy in children with Duchenne. So there is a debate between prednisolone versus deflazacort. So I'll uh, dwell into it. So this is the Duchenne uh, basic pathogenesis behind it. That's how I told my parents to understand the thing. So this is the protein and these are the genes. Uh, the strophin gene with 79 exons and we tell them this is like a string of pearl and if you have breakage in between any of these exons the whole kind of garland is broken and we cannot have a functional protein with that and this is the biopsy of representative section and you can see this is a normal checkerboard appearance of a healthy muscle and this is a biopsy of a boy with Duchenne so look at this these cells are dying there is lots of fibrosis and there is necrosis in these cells so that's why these muscles tend to become weaker and there is a, some part of inflammation like cells tend to attack on these muscles so they are weaker now. So uh, till now what we know that there is an absence of curative therapy for Duchenne but we have supportive care like wheelchairs, spine surgery, uh, mechanical ventilation, feeding assistance. So even in presence of supportive care only the world, western world could increase the lifespan of Duchenne boy by, by approximately five to 10 years, even in the absence of steroid therapy as well as uh, gene therapy. So these forms the backbone of the therapeutic regimen for children with Duchenne. So steroids in DMD uh, was initially used in 1989 with a few cases. Later on studies has been published, several of the randomized control trials has been published. And we should understand that steroids remains only pharmacological palliative treatment for all forms of Duchenne, whether it is a a specific gene or it is an age so steroid is available for all and they are accessible to all and even with the recent advances in gene therapy with exon skipping therapy steroids remains the backbone of therapy so all the trial says that patient has to be on a stable dose of steroid for so many months so this we cannot avoid while we are treating with treating our boys with Duchenne so this was the first randomized control trial published by Dr. Mendel et al. in 1989. So after 30 years, still we have all those questions still uh, in our mind that how should we use steroids in these boys. 
So several of the guidelines has recommended use of steroid. I can see this one like in 2016, AN guideline has published including they analyzed the 34 studies published till that point of time. And what they have concluded that there is evidence to use steroids in boys with Duchenne muscular dystrophy and that use of steroids leads to improvement in muscle strength measured by time function tests, lung functions, they helps in stabilization of scoliosis. So the number of patients who require scoliosis surgery is really down with the use of steroids. That is evident in the uh, clinics which are running in the Western world for so many years, but still in our country, it is not available to us. And onset of Duchenne related cardiomyopathy also improves with the use of steroids. And previously it was told that uh, Deflazacort and prednisolone both are equivalent in efficacy and they were found to that steroid use uh, delays the loss of ambulation by two and a half year approximately in boys if it is used for more than one year. But the side effects are there. We have specific side effects to each steroid and some are generic side effects like weight gain, cataract. So this is an important studies and rig study which is published in 2018 only. So these are the milestones which are clinically relevant to us like and these are the patient who has received less than one month of steroid and these are the patient who received more than one year of steroid. So all the parameters in patients who has taken more than one year of steroids has prolonged in these uh, abilities. So like their ambulation was preserved till 15 years. They had this climbing ability till 15 years. They could stand easily. Their standing time was less even in the upper arm, the hand functions were preserved in patients who received steroids for more than one year. So this is the uh, 2018 guidelines, which Dr. Ann has already spoken about. So this is the steroid therapy flow chart given in these guidelines. So how to initiate, you discuss with the parents about the role of steroids, uh, uh, inform about the side effects, nutritional requirement, what could be the uh, dosing regimen, and when they should start, it should be started before there is a substantial physical decline. And there could be prednisolone as well as deplazacort and they has to be managed with frequent visits. You have to follow, you cannot start steroids and just leave the, pan, uh, leave the child. So you have to follow them every three monthly, two monthly to see is there any is a side effect, there is excessive weight gain to manage that. And uh, even in non-ambulatory boys, if you have started steroid, you should continue with the Least, side, least dose which has minimal side effects. And if you have not started steroids, those who are non-ambulatory steroid may still help them with the management of their upper limb, uh, preserving their upper limb strength, avoiding scoliosis, uh, delay in initiation of cardiomyopathy. So they has to be started. So once started, you cannot stop them abruptly. It has to be slowly and gradually tapered off. It is required. So there are several types of steroids which are used. So the main are prednisolone and prednisone, which is kind of classical steroid. The newer ones are deflazacort and vomerolone. Vomerolone is kind of a investigative steroid specifically for Duchenne, which is under trials. But deflazacort is, has been approved by FDA in 2017 for use, of, use in uh, Duchenne. Prednisolone remains in off-label use because it is not, indicate, not approved for this indication, but deflazacort has been approved for this indication now. So usually it is less potent, but it has less mineralocorticoid side effects. And in presence of hepatic disease or hepatitis, one has to be cautious for using the plaza cord. So these are the number of side effects which we encounter when you start these patients on steroids like weight gain, Cushingoid appearance, hypertension, behavioral issues, growth retardation, delayed pubertal achievement, peptic ulcer, GERD, diabetes, or glucose intolerance, adrenal suppression, hirsutism, acne, and cataract, and so on and so forth. So there's, there are thousands of side effects with steroid, but we have to make a balance between uh, choosing a right dose and uh, keeping them in mind with regular follow-ups to detect them early and modify our regimens. So there are several uncertainties in steroid therapy, even after three decades of use, like when to start, what is the age? Like you have to start at four years or six years or seven years. Which steroid I start, which regimen I use, I use give daily or I give alternate days or give weekends. And what is expected to improvement? Like we cannot have like uh, uh, expectation like they will remarkably improve the uh, disability, but we have to be reasonable and we have to ensure, uh, inform the parents about the facts in terms of how much improvement is expected 
once you start how long it has to be given and the some important thing is that steroids we don't know how do they really work in children with duchenne so in some of the muscle in normal patient if you give steroid the muscle tend to weak but in children with duchenne if you give steroids muscle tend to improve gain the abilities so this study says there is lots of variance in the practice of use of steroid across the uh, country so so you can understand this in this usa study so still there are 10 centers who are not using steroids 29 of different types of steroid regimen has been used like somebody gives with some doses on alternate days uh, weekends or daily or so the most common one is like prednisolone and aflazacort at 0.9 mg per kg has been used so a uh, situation may be more worse in india where there are some still centers are there which may not even be using steroids or parents may not be convinced about use of steroids in these boys so we have to tell the parents what is expected benefits what are the side effects uh, so we have to make them that it should be the backbone of the therapy so if you search clinicaltrial.org then you can see there are 23 studies ongoing on the steroids in duchenne so the most common one most important ones are four uh, four dmg trial as well as bomerlone trial so i to identify like what is the age which age we have to start what is the maximal duration maximal doses and what is the most suitable regimen could be there so uh, so this is an important paper which said that children who use more than one year of steroids has approximately three year gain in their walking abilities and the plaza cot was associated with later loss of ambulation than prednisone but you can see the doses were less like they have used 0.5 mg the plaza cot was used also on the lesser 0.75 mg so the optimal regimens has been not been a, uh, all over the across the world physicians are not able to stick to that optimal regimen uh, doses which are recommended because of side effects so they have to come down on the doses so uh, this is a nutshell how the plaza cot is better than prednisolone uh you can see the 6 minute walk is more preserved all the parameters are better in patients who has received diflazacort like they have better post tear abilities uh they have both better times in descent rise from the supine as well as 6 minute walk test and this is the difference so like uh, in uh, prednisolone versus diflazacort boys who received diflazacort has 28 meter higher a uh, 6 minute walking ability similarly all the parameter shows a clinically meaningful improvement with the plaza cot in comparison to prednisolone so this is a meta analysis of the published studies till now but i want to say that it is not only the drugs it's not only the gene therapy it's not only the steroids we have to do all these 12 steps while we manage these patient because they requires a multidisciplinary care so physiotherapy nutrition orthosis spine care respiratory care cardiac care immunization bone health steroids so all these are important aspect of management so if our focus is towards only how do we get gene therapy we are losing on these 11 steps so this 12th step has to be built on these 11 steps so i want to say that to the parents who are listening that do not skip all these steps this has to be there so recent meta analysis suggests the plaza cot is working better for uh, children with duchenne by preserving the ambulation and tft shows lesser decline in the plaza cot group there are adverse effect with all forms of steroid but cataract and growth retardation is more frequent with the plaza cot but weight gain is less with the plaza cot and the use of steroid practices varies across the physicians all over the world and but i want to say that steroid has to be part of therapeutic regimen for these boys with duchenne and i want to tell the parents think of 11 steps to do not fix on the one last step that is step number 12 to go on gene therapy if you do all these 11 step then only the gene therapy is going to work for your child so think about these 11 steps too so this is the my take home message for all so thank you all this is team pgi and we all thank you for and congratulate for this virtual conference it's kind of nice initiative thank you thank you doctor thank you so much uh, it was a really lovely start talk we will remember those 12 steps if you don't mind if you share your ppt with us we'll make sure that it reaches out sure. to the parents and the people who are watching next up is a legend in the medical circles is dr ic verma we are so happy to have him here dr ic verma i know it's been a long day thank you so much sir for waiting uh, we are indeed honored and privileged Uh, to have you here, sir. The floor is yours. Mm. 
my friends and colleagues it's a real pleasure to be talking to you the topic that has been given to me am i audible yes sir you are sir we are good and we can see screen as well the role of clinicians and hospitals in research and therapy i will not be strictly sticking to this particular topic so i think one important thing is i started almost 50 years ago and every time i saw a patient i had to remind myself that this is a burdensome disease and it's a depressing disease in some extent so i must show optimism and i must show hope for these patients for many years we have the only had non surgical treatment and of course even we have to convince them even now there are many who come and not even willing to take steroids they say we have to convince them that it is on standard of care and then we have to take it uh, although it may do slight harm now of course we are telling the patient the we are telling the man here specific therapy will be coming soon so the one important task of the doctor is to keep up the spirits of the patient and the parents and to keep them in bond of new developments so in the meantime waiting for the new developments we of course did the decision and duplication and prepared ourselves for the exon stripping revolution we did lesion and duplication and linkage and offered the people prenatal diagnosis we immediately came up with an ethical issue if it's a boy it's easy to say okay the boy is affected but if it's a girl many parents want to know if it's a carrier or not but the law the law does not allow us to reveal we have to only say whether fetus is affected or not so that's the game and that is issue which needs to be resolved so we have done ml pa in a large number of patients 1600 and we found deletion this is 66% and duplication in 5.9% and there were no change in about 28% of course some of them probably were not at the end days so there is this hot spot from exon 44 to 53 So and we carried out a number and said uh, how many will be helped by exon skipping of 51, 53, and we found 51 for the maximum, but 32 percent would be helped. So if you see if exon 53, it will be 23 percent. So if you take these seven exons, you will be helped almost 92 percent patients of DMD in India. So you know there are two types of like that. This is uh, yes, so. One of the negatively done, which did not work, which actually failed, and uh, but it was the neutral ones, the morpholinos, which have worked and which have been approved by FDA. But they are prohibitively expensive, and uh, they are more useful, of course, in patients who are mobile. But after all, although they are not real NCLs, but they do, they are the best after the steroids, and the. Uh, So that is so expensive. There are hardly anybody in India using these. So I would like to compliment Dr. Ravdeep Singh and the Dart that they have uh, manufactured these in India, and they have recently got approval from DGCI for these three exons. Although they have the capability to make others also, I like Ravdeep's spirit of never say die. So the stop all those. The uh, if the there are no MLP and there is no show any deletion, we found about fifty percent of the rest had these called shock put on. We have sequenced about hundred of them. Now gene therapy, the last one, you know, we have been waiting for a long time. I missed the talk by Steve in the beginning, but Mendel, we were expecting it will be approved, but I haven't heard so far. Munich have done the good work, and there is one Dr. Dixon and Mendel who actually split the gene into three parts. I think the most likely, the most uh, promising is the one from University of North Carolina. They of course first make a IPSC cell line for the patient, and then uh, correct the defect with CRISPR, and then put it back to the adenovirus virus. And some of these patients are running around and doing very well. So I think there is good hope that this is going to work. Thank you very much. I will try to keep my time. I don't know. I hope I have. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, and it has. Uh, it was indeed 
exactly to time and exactly to content. Uh, thank you so much for spending your time with us, sir. Uh, you can stop share now. And uh, I would like to call uh, our next international speaker talking to us all the way from either Paris or somewhere in Europe, uh, Dr. Andoni. Uh, Dr. Ar Andoni Utsbiria is uh, currently he works with Treat and MD and a couple of other hospitals in Paris. We are indeed very honored to uh, have him with us. So let's just say, and there you go. Yes, okay, we can hear us. Yeah. Uh, doctor, we can't hear you. It says. And it says it's not muted, but then we can't hear you. Yeah, you're, you're not muted, but we can't hear you. Let me see. Uh, no. No, no, no. Uh, it now it's mute. I'll ask you to unmute. You just muted you. Just mute it, yeah. I just sent you. Uh, so it says unmuted here. Uh, it doesn't have the mute symbol over here. What I uh, shall we try one thing? Can you leave Zoom and come back? I'll let you in. All right, cool. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, sorry about that. Uh, we have a small technical issue, but we should be able to get that up front about. Uh, uh, can I ask Dr. Arun Shastri to come on camera and say a few words to thank uh, the clinicians who have spoken so far to IC Verma sir and Agnes Matthew and Ray Luna. Uh, Arun? Yeah. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, it's very uh, good to see a lot of eminent clinicians like Dr. I.C. Verma, Dr. Renu, Dr. Ann Matthew to join us. And uh, Dr. Andoni has been very close to us. Uh, actually, last year I was in Europe. Every year he organizes this uh, summer school in Treat and MD where uh, he trains everybody. And uh, we are very lucky to have them. And uh, from Bangalore, we had uh, Dr. Meenakshi Bhatt who had uh, spoken earlier. Uh, she has been supporting us a lot. Uh, she, uh, a lot of patients have received uh, benefit from uh, genetic counseling with her. And the topics which are covered from the clinical point of view with the steroids, that plus occurred versus prednisone was an interesting debate. And uh, the talk by Dr. Ann Matthew on the importance of uh, heart in DMD is also a very important thing which we need to take care. And uh, I think once these sessions are over, I'll be answering the questions. I have noted down most of the questions. And uh, in case if I don't answer, please feel free to write an email to me. I have written my email ID. I think Dr. Andron is back now. Over to him. Uh, doctor? I am. Yes. Yes. Can you hear me now? Okay, that's yes. good. Bonjour. Bonjour. <laughs> uh, so, okay, so I'm going to share my my screen. Uh, where should I go? Um, uh, yeah. We have, yeah. yes. Yes. Anyway, you have a backup of my. I do. I do. Of my book. Uh, yes. Okay. And so you're crystal clear. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, I was given uh, this topic for you, uh, which is about clinical development of innovative, innovative therapies in tissue and muscular dystrophy. And I will also uh, talk to you about uh, 3DNMD, which I belong to, which is an, an alliance, a worldwide alliance to uh, combat uh, neuromuscular diseases. Um, just my disclosure I'm basically a clinician. Uh, teaching uh, neuromyology uh, worldwide and uh, being a consultant for, for industry uh, as well. 
Um, just to remind you that um, we, we've achieved a long, long way from the discovery of, uh, of the disease and the first reports of the disease, um, the discovery of the gene in 1987. And nowadays, uh, what's even more exciting is the a new era uh, with clinical trials and with the drugs being approved uh, in some countries. And we're going to review this uh, quite uh, rapidly. But, but for, um, patient's perspective I mean, it's, it's quite fascinating in a sense of course this is this doesn't go um as fast as we could expect especially when when you have a trial with the shen but but overall um the perspective is just fantastic from a disease where we almost knew nothing we're now um having treatments more or less efficient we'll discuss that but this is very promising um uh, and even more promising is the the, the drug development pipeline that we we have now for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. This is just a cartoon from uh, the PPMD uh, website uh, taken uh, two years ago uh, and the list was already very significant with a number of drugs, compounds, uh, uh, different approaches um, being applied um, either in animals that was phase one in, uh, or preclinical studies and then in humans and phase one, phase two, uh, etc. Um, as you can see, this is uh, really huge. It's a huge pipeline. Uh, many of these drugs here are going to die in a sense. Uh, uh, that excuse me, doctor. doctor? Yeah. We, are, yes. we are only seeing your uh, computer documents. We are seeing the UK DMD dot talk September 2020. We are not seeing the PPT as such. Could you, could you again take mine? I mean, if you, you okay. have access to uh, Okay, I, I, I do, I do, I do. Shall I do that? Please do yes. that. Can you just, exactly. you, can, you can stop your share and I'll do that. Okay, let's do that. So how do I do? Uh, how do I stop sharing? <laughs> One second. Uh, I, I can do it from my end, don't worry. Yeah, please do that. Yeah, yeah. I'm not familiar with that. Continue. Yes. Okay. So that's full screen. Okay, that's done. Uh, which so which one? slide would you like to be in? Yes. Next one. Yes, next one. Okay, that was the diagram about the history. So that's yeah. the, the history called perspective in vision muscular dystrophy. And as we can see, this is very exciting and we, did, we achieved a lot. Next. Um, next slide. Okay, this is the drug pipeline I was talking about, uh, taken from the PPMD website in two years ago with many drugs being tried uh, worldwide, uh, either at the print clinical uh, level, that is in, in, in animal, animal models, and then in humans. Uh, next one, uh, this is, next slide. Um, this is a more uh, updated uh, version of this uh, PPMD uh, website with the, the current pipeline. And as you can see, when there's a, a, a dot there, uh, some of these drugs have been approved, uh, especially in the US, and we'll come back to that. Especially the, 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 um, the eggs and skipping drug like Eggendis, uh, Viltepro, we're talking about uh, Viltepro 53, and many others are still uh, coming up and most probably will be approved, uh, at least for uh, the PMO that we've been talking about. Next. Next slide shows you that we have actually a multitude of uh, therapeutic options in Duchenne muscular dystrophy, even though uh, very few of them have been approved or showed uh, a real efficacy at the clinical level. Um, we can use gene therapies, we can use cell therapies, we can use pharmacotherapy, uh, and all, some of these drugs have been already mentioned by the previous speakers, so um, I would just focus on one of them, a few of them, which is eggs and skipping to start with. Next slide, please. And just to remind you that if uh, people are, and especially farmers, are, are, are targeting uh, or focusing on certain exons, just because uh, for the strategy they're trying uh, to match the, 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 the largest proportion of uh, patients amenable to, to eggs and skipping. In other words, uh, if you skip eggs and 51, uh, you're going to get approximately 17.5% of the people. If you target uh, 53, um, then you will have another 7.7%. 7 
uh, and so on and so forth. So if you just uh, target three uh, exons, such as 51, 53, and 45, then you'll have approximately 40% of DND patients. And that's why all industries now are moving to this. Um, the question is about the other exons and what's going to happen to the, the people left aside, in a sense, uh, with mutations or uh, isolated exon uh, collision. And this is a matter of concern for the future. Next slide. Okay, this is the current um, situation for uh, exon skipping drugs uh, in vision muscular dystrophy. As you can read here, uh, three of them have been officially approved by FDA. I must say that in Europe, we haven't uh, approved any of them, uh, most probably due to a lack of uh, clinical evidence uh, for full approval. Um, so you have uh, exon Ds, which has been approved now uh, more than two years ago by Sarepta. Uh, exon 53, uh, just uh, earlier this year, uh, what's a Viandis, and uh, uh, interestingly, the Japanese people um, have designed their own uh, PMO, uh, also targeting 53, and it's been approved by FDA, interestingly. Uh, ex um, drug uh, um, skipping exon 45 uh, called Azimersen, or most probably the brand name will be Amandis 45, uh, is just pending. They've got interesting uh, results, and they're I guess will be approved next year. But in the pipeline, the same pipeline, we also know that there will be more uh, PMOs in the near future. We, you talk uh, about your own product design at Dart, and, and, and that's fascinating. Um, many others are still uh, behind uh, the recyclo DNA uh, that we have in France, and the, the next generation PPMO, uh, which will potentially be more efficient at the clinical level. Next. Um, now, just a few slides about the, the other very exciting field of gene therapy, which is the microdystrophine. Next one. And just to remind you that uh, when you deal with full length uh, dystrophine, you're quite happy. But if you remove some parts of it, especially the central domain of uh, the dystrophin uh, protein, then actually you won't harm much the, the, the protein and, and its function. And therefore, uh, scientists designed uh, shorter versions of um, this dystrophin, uh, uh, leading to the mini dystrophin and even a smaller micro dystrophin, which is still active. It's not a full length protein, but still it has some function and it can help uh, the patient. Next one. So we've used this in clinical, uh, next one, uh, the, the, we've used this in animal models and the, to our uh, great excitement, the, the, the outcome was really, really good with a good repression of dystrophin in almost all fibers. Next one, next slide. Uh, as you can see here in animals, you, with the, the wild type dog, the, the GRMT dog, which is a, a sick dog with uh, no uh, dystrophin at all. And when you treat him with the micro dystrophin, led by um, a, an adenovirus, then you re-express almost all the dystrophin. So just based on that, we went on into clinic, uh, that is in human beings, to try this approach. Next uh, slide. Yes, next one. Next one. This is just the evidence of the, the, the fantastic outcome in, in box treated that way. Next one. So actually, there are many uh, um, files uh, underway uh, for gene therapy using micro or mini dystrophin, and we'll review them uh, very briefly. Next one. Um, one conducted by Solid Biosciences has actually been a, a sort of a failure. It started well, but they had to, 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 to stop and halt the, uh, the trial due to safety concerns so at this point. Um, the trial is just ended, and we don't know what's going to do uh, solid biosciences in the future regarding this program. Next. Uh, yes, that, that's what when they had to, to hold the, the, the trial that was two years ago. Next one. Uh, more promising is the microdystrophin trial uh, led by Sarepta. 
uh, where you have the, the, the full details here, I won't recommend them, but it's, it's a microdystrophy impact in a very specific AAV uh, driven by a very specific promoter uh, with a reasonably high dose of uh, factors injected just uh, in a single injection uh, in the child and an IV injection. And the outcome is just very good. I mean, it, it, the re-expression is, is of dystrophin is seen in Western blood, in immunoblots, and the CK are just down, and the scores at the clinical level, is the NSA scores are uh, also uh, significantly higher. Um, as you can see here, the, the number of patients dosed at date is limited, so only four, but hopefully they, we didn't note any uh, serious safety concern. Next. So, uh, based on this, the, the, the company has uh, came to embark on a, a phase two trial uh, with more people, I mean, more patients, uh, and it'll be uh, versus placebo. Um, the, the, the AV and the promoter will be the same. Uh, at this point, they wanted to have it in Columbus, in Los Angeles, in the USA, but they will probably extend uh, the trial to Europe very soon. Next. So the Pfizer company um, has also designed its own uh, mini dystrophy, a slight difference here, but it doesn't matter much. Um, and they had uh, this phase 1B uh, open label trial with a different AV, but still with an AV9 containing this uh, mini dystrophy. 15 boys have been enrolled um, with two different uh, cohorts. It had some serious adverse effect, it has to be noted. Um, but generally speaking, it's been okay. Uh, and again, the expression of transgene uh, assessed by blotting and, 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 and immunofluorescence has been uh, quite significant. I mean, 24% if you use the low dose and 51% if you use the, the high dose. So that's promising, definitely. Next. Um, and we have our own um, program uh, at Geneton, which is a French laboratory belonging, just like that, uh, to a patient proxy group called AFEN uh, So we plan to have a controlled randomized trial in the near future with 40 DMD boys with a placebo group with the crossover period. Uh, it will be again a one single IV injection uh, and using a micro dystrophin. And all this will be manufactured in France and not in the US. Uh, and again, uh, by a bench of the French Micro Dystrophy Association. And we, we hope to, I mean, we look forward to, to start uh, this trial uh, earlier next year. Next. Okay, so basically, and I just gave you two examples, um, the, the, the PMO, I mean, the eggs and skipping drug, and the, the, the Micro Dystrophy. And that's fascinating again, we've got, we've got Many, many, many successes there. Uh, we have many trials. A number of kids have been exposed to clinical trials in the past 10 or 15 years. We have four approved drugs for DMD. Here again, we'll just show them here. Uh, so it's, and we have an impressive, still expanding pipeline. Uh, a growing number of farmers are just entering the arena, uh, which is very promising. And uh, we have clinicians, we have clinical trials centers in place and they work together and that's just great. And uh, people involved in these trials, either the industry, but also clinicians and patient advocacy groups just interact. I mean, they talk to each other, they talk with the regulators to have the, the best design as possible for, for the trials and so on. Next, next one. But the, the, the flip side of the, of the coin is that uh, we, we do have challenges, I mean, because we have, uh, we must be honest, a rather poor or limited clinical efficacy. Of course, we're able to uh, re-express dystrophin uh, in the muscle uh, membrane, but um, uh, from clinical viewpoint, we're very often disappointed or we have limitations and frustration, of course. Uh, safety concerns uh, are there now, especially when using pain therapy, as we showed for the solid uh, trial. Uh, you know, when you deal with gene therapy, that, that could be hazardous and uh, we have to be uh, cautious. Uh, the main problem is uh, um, pointed out by uh, Professor Firma is that access to this therapy has remained uh, very challenging and very few patients have access to it, definitely. Uh, we need more reliable biomarkers to assess the efficacy of such drugs. Uh, we may have a, a concern with patient enrollment 
um, because uh, all this problems have multiplied in the past 10 years and then we might face a bottleneck to that. And that's why we need to involve more countries like India. Um, competition, duplication and sustainability might be also an issue. Uh, beware of fake news, beware of fake drugs. It, it will happen, it already happened for SMA. Uh, we have to be conscious uh, and, and take care of this. And finally, hype, hope and controversies will happen. It happened in the past, but it, it will probably happen too. And so we need to balance the, the hype and hope. Uh, again, not create uh, too much frustration in families and, and in patients as well. Next one. Um, just two words uh, about the Treat NND. Uh, as you may remember, this was originally a European network, but it went global. Uh, which is good news. Next one. And we do a lot of, a lot of things and many of you I mean, clinicians or even patient toxic are involved in this uh, network. We deal with registries, we deal with education, with clinical tasks, uh, with all sorts of things. We have a website and you can join. You can join it. It's very large and it's, uh, it's a good joint forces anyway. Uh, next one. Um, just to illustrate this uh, okay, next one. Um, yeah, this is about the registry. Now we have a global registry, uh, all serving as a hub for different diseases and from all over the world. Uh, and then we can talk to industry uh, all together and then that, that, that's very good to speed up clinical trials. Next, and this is just uh, next slide. Yes, an example of how um, a treat NND and these different registries are interacting with the industry. Um, regarding clinical trials and the way you might be interested to, to design your own trial, um, selecting outcome measures and so on, um, you can submit your application to the TAC. The TAC is a treat NND adversary committee for therapeutics, and, and they, they've done very good, very good reviews of, of different files before entering the trial itself. So they advised industries, they advised different clinicians uh, when they were having a new drug or new molecule. To do the test. Next, again, you could join, join this, okay? This is the, the website and become a member of the Treat NMD, that's quite simple. You just need to, to fill, up, fill up the form online um, patient organizations are welcome, as well as individual healthcare providers, such as physicians uh, from all over the world. We do have Indian representatives already. I think we've got a number of them, but you could expand the number just by uh, looking at the website and registering yourself. Next. Next one. Next. Uh, yes. So, Daniyavad, uh, Rumbanandri, for your attention. Ah, merci beaucoup. Uh, yeah, you are, welcome. Sir. Uh, if you do not mind, you if you can share the PPT with us, we would be more than happy to have, post it and make it available for people outside. And for everybody who's watching, uh, both Dr. Arun Shastri and I uh, are uh, members of Treat and MD, and we we really look forward to everything that they're doing. They're extremely proactive. They have a lot of meetings. Students, if you're watching, please log in. If you're into rare diseases and definitely neuromuscular disorders, become a member of Treat NMD. Uh, you have lots of people and mentors who will help you on the way. Thank you, Dr. Anthony, for a lovely talk. You're Thank welcome. you for, and your day is just starting. So wish you a very happy World Dishon Awareness Day. Thank and you. do let us know when you re release your red balloon and we will make sure that we hand out to you. Okay. Thank you, doctor. You're welcome. Thank you. So that brings us to one of our uh, most important people we're going to talk now, Dr. Sartak Kamak. Now, some of you might know Sartak Kamak from our conference we had last year where he was there uh, physically to talk to us. And recently, we've also seen uh, a couple of articles about him. So uh, I have known Sartak for quite some time now. Can I ask Sartak to come on the video, please? Uh, and I've known him for quite some time. He's been a constant source of inspiration, source of motivation. And every time we talk to him, we feel so reinvigorated 
and re-energized. And he's a perfect person to end this session uh, for us. And so, Sartek, uh, the floor's over to you. Uh, you can tell us a few things about yourself and where you are. And I also know for a fact that uh, Dr. Andoni and you also go a long way back. Yes. Go ahead, Sartek. The floor is all yours. Yeah. Sure. So, uh, I am Dr. Sartek Kamath and I am a psychiatrist by profession. Okay. My uh, education, I... Uh, was initially in a CBSE school, but uh, due to, because I was being diagnosed as uh, Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, I wasn't allowed to continue there. And, uh, you know, I had to change to a state syllabus school. But once I uh, finished 10th, my life really changed. I uh, completed my uh, PUC in uh, Sheshadripuram Pre-University College. I completed my MBBS from uh, MS Ramaya. And on uh, 20, on uh, I think, yeah, 14th of August, I completed my uh, MD psychiatry from uh, Kempe Gowda Institute of Medical Sciences in Bangalore. Uh, in addition to uh, mental health, I have a lot of other interests, which include uh, geography. You know, as a kid, I used to love uh, looking at the map and, you know, see where each country is, the capitals of countries, etc. I've also uh, been a keyboard player since uh, way back, but currently due to my uh, redu reduction in the upper limb strength, I'm not able to do that. In addition, I've participated in uh, many, uh, you know, quizzes, uh, chess competitions, and also I enjoy seeing uh, movies and TV shows, especially the ones on uh, Netflix. Uh, uh, I, uh, the last time I met Bertie was at the, uh, this one, Brian Adams concert in uh, Bangalore. It was a really great experience. So I would, uh, might, uh, uh, can I uh, share the screen? Sure. I have given you share screen. You can share screen. Yeah. yeah. So. Uh, is it visible? Yes, it is visible. Uh, the f yeah, now it's in full screen also. Please continue. Yeah, sure. So uh, this is my topic. And you know, today has been a, a wonderful day. It's as all of you know, uh, uh, World Duchenne's Awareness Day and uh, all the speakers before me have done excellent uh, presentations. So like uh, Bertie said, uh, it's a closing time for me. And the thing that is repeated from last year's conference is uh, my presentation has come after Dr. Andonis. So see this, like the other doctors have explained very well that, you know, there's a muscle cell. So there's this dystrophin protein, which is very important to maintain the integrity of the muscle. So like a very small mutation in this can cause a lot of, uh, you know, problems. And here we have our second enemy of the a year, I would say, because it's almost uh, been for a year, the COVID-19 pandemic. So let's uh, look at what uh, psychiatric issues would occur in uh, uh, patients with uh, Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. Uh, see, Duchenne's muscular dystrophy is what we call as a life event in uh, psychiatric terms. So life event refers to any event that occurs in a person's life. Like see, the usual life events are like... Uh, finishing education, getting married, having kids, etc. But there are some life events that are not common to everybody, like having a disease or, uh, you know, uh, having a loved one pass away, things like that. Okay. So, and uh, as the other doctors have mentioned, there is loss of mobility in uh, uh, Duchenne's. As a result, it uh, causes a lot of problems like children, might feel that I am not able to walk, but other children around me are doing very well, you know, and that 
sometimes leads to a, a difficulty in adjustment, what we call in our terms as adjustment disorder. That is, you have a particular life event and you're having challenges adjusting to them. And at times it can also result in anxiety, like a child uh, doesn't know what these symptoms are, why they occur. And also in the future, he might uh, have, you know, a lot of anxiety about what might happen. Some people also go into depression at this time. And to add on to that, uh, as the other speakers mentioned, lot of, uh, a, drug, a lot of stuff is being tried to cure DMD and uh, but the results are not uh, that great. And as of now, only thing we have is to prevent progression of DMD, not actually uh, cure it. To add to that, there's also the reactions to others. Like the uh, teachers mentioned that uh, sometimes it's difficult for other children to understand the needs of a patient with DMD. So uh, most of the time, rather than showing empathy, they like show sympathy. Sympathy is in the sense like feeling sorry for the uh, child, but not actually helping, which actually uh, r destroys the self-confidence of a kid. So I would like people to understand that empathy is a more important thing. See, empathy is you are uh, put yourself in the feet of the person. Like, see, if parents have a child with DMD, you imagine uh, you had DMD, then what would you go through? So that will help you understand the child better rather than feeling, oh, like Papa, the child can't do anything. Uh, it's okay, like things like that. Okay. And all of this in turn can actually uh, cause restriction in the social life. See, because uh, especially like, you know, some uh, cities, Bangalore is becoming better, but most of the places there's not even a uh, proper wheelchair access. So like, you know, going out with uh, friends and interacting with others. Those things are not so great. Uh, and now coming to steroids. So um, numerous clinical studies have showed that steroids are like uh, the drug of choice for uh, preventing uh, or to some extent uh, reducing the progression of uh, DMD. Okay, but uh, they also have their own side effects, which include the uh, weight gain, uh, burning, uh, burning sensation in the stomach, osteoporosis, and the other side effects that the doctors mentioned. In addition to that, there is uh, physiotherapy. Uh, see, I uh, feel that if, uh, because it's a, a lifelong condition, Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, so doing, uh, physio again and again, and uh, sometimes not finding any improvement or, you know, uh, the condition deteriorating, this demotivates the patients. So this has been the situation till the start of our uh, second enemy, that is COVID. Okay, so these are the uh, challenges of COVID and the situation is much worse for all of us with DMD due to the additional uh, you know, burden of the disease. Uh, so uh, currently the schools and colleges are shut. They're actually beginning to open, but it's been almost six months in when they've, st uh, they've stopped and online classes are going on. Okay, the one disadvantage here is that, see, when children go to school, it's like they have to read school at, imagine uh, eight, and uh, they have their periods, you know, at uh, this time to this time, they have uh, whatever English or uh, science, the like. And also in a classroom, the teacher will be able to uh, observe each and every child and uh, pick up problems easily. Uh, see, as has been mentioned before, uh, we people of DMD, we uh, require a bit uh, more uh, care. And like uh, Manjuma mentioned, uh, see, we can also be better than the so-called normal children in some aspects. Okay, um, so that's what. Now the structure is completely gone. And uh, for us, when we go to school, we used to talk to uh, people, right? So that is also stopped. 
okay in addition the online classes i feel that it's very difficult to uh, like concentrate in them and see the usual uh, attention span if you uh, consider it as 30 minutes it would be around you know 15 or 10 minutes like for that in addition to that there's like staying at home is recommended because you know if the uh, children further go out and they you know something happens to them it's a, a more serious uh, problem okay we also have something that uh, people consider as a second pandemic that is the a fear of getting covid because you know it's all over the news that covid causes this like this many cases are there in the world it causes this many deaths so you know that causes some kind of uh, uh, anxiety or uh, stress in the children and now because uh, everything has to be shut down it will be risky to take the uh, children with dmd to the physiotherapist but uh, as uh, mr anand mentioned uh, the they've done uh, i think online uh, physio yeah he mentioned online uh, physio for see so these are the challenges so what all can we do see first is we need to accept the situation which is the first step see it's like we have got dmd and there is a covid and whatever we do cannot change it the one good thing here is maybe in uh, you know few months or so the cases might start decreasing and you know the situation would be better i also uh, advise uh, like uh, parents to monitor this so that they take their medications properly that is the corticosteroids and also regular physiotherapy have, has to be done as mentioned by the physiotherapists and uh, this is an uh, these two are an absolute uh, necessity for uh, children with dmd also uh, nutrition is a very important thing so like uh, usually diet rich in proteins is uh, what doctors uh, recommend okay. and see now because uh, everything is like online see due to like many children who like you know continue playing games or are on the internet for a long time it disturbs their sleep cycle so what i would suggest is the uh, parents can help the child in creating uh, one time for sleeping and one time for getting up so that regularizes the uh, sleep wake cycle which can in turn reduce other problems there's something that we call an activity scheduling that is putting a timetable like i mentioned uh, uh, when children go to school it's a particular timetable that they have to follow so here parents can uh, make a timetable for the children if they aren't able to like they have to get up at this time uh, you know uh, bathe or do their regular activities uh, those kind of things also uh, uh, as um, the previous speaker mentioned uh, children are at home with the parents so it's a very good chance for the parents to sit with the child talk about uh, feelings of the child in an empathetic way you know which really helps and as the previous speaker mentioned uh, if there is a chance where the uh, child becomes a bit aggressive or doesn't listen to what is said you can do a star chart technique that is for every good behavior the child does you can put a star and a particular number of stars like around five stars or something could get the child a reward the reward uh, you know the patient the, the parents can decide based on the uh, you know interest of the child and uh, now there is uh, you know teleconsultation has just you know uh, it's been used a lot so like uh, you know teleconsultation with the psychiatrist or the other clinician uh, could be done and see like uh, the children the children with dmd might be missing their friends but uh, you know that now uh, the, the social media is really great so you can just 
you know, call up anyone, maybe a Zoom call or a WhatsApp chat can be done. And uh, I feel to end uh, this uh, session, it's always good to be done with pictures. So this is my uh, graduation photo, uh, my MBBS graduation from uh, Ms. Ramaya. This is me with my family having uh, dinner at a restaurant. This is me with my uh, uh, fellow colleagues and interns. As I've mentioned in a lot of my previous interviews, we still uh, go out. Like this is the uh, tipsy bull place which we had gone to. So like uh, my friends, they always see that, you know, the particular area is wheelchair accessible so that we can go there. Uh, this is me in my uh, uh, buildings uh, march past and uh, this is me hoisting the flag. As always, I would like to end, end a quote with uh, who was one of the greatest uh, minds of all time and who had the most severe form of uh, motor neuron disease, Stephen Hawking. He says, however difficult life may seem, there is always something you can do and succeed at. It matters that you don't just uh, give up. Thank you. Thank you, Sartak. Thank you so much. Um... I also have something for you. So while we were talking, I realized I recognized one of the posters behind you. It's also one of my favorite posters. And <laughs> this is, it's not who I am underneath, but what I do that defines me from the dark night. And I absolutely love that poster and it perfectly defines what you do right now. So thank you so much, Sartek. And uh, this, yes, brings to an end the sessions, but it's not the end of the talk. So uh, now we have the very, very important DMD warriors. So we would now like to call a few parents and children uh, who have been the reason this is all going on to share a few words. And after that, we will have Dr. Arun Shastri and if we prime for much, uh, Vishnu also to take out the questions and do something on physiology. But to start off this session, I can call only one person, the person who is responsible for all of this. The, the, well, I just last year, uh, the year before, we were saying the boy who started this, but now I have to say the man who started this, uh, Karan Veer Anand. Uh, good friend, my brother from another mother. Karan, can we have you online, please? And if possible, also get a shadow, also if possible. Bring some more color. <laughs> and there you are. Hi, Karan. Hi. How can you, doing? you hear me? Yes, very well. How do you do? Oh, you have your guitar and your hazel. Yep. Yeah. So say hi to everyone and tell us how does it feel to be in the second virtual international conference? It's good. We should have this more often. I know, right? I know. So what are you doing now, Karan? Uh, like, you are in college, right? Yep. We spoke to your college principal. She seemed very happy. Yeah, it's very important. Education, school, college. It's uh, it's nice what Manju ma'am and Nagatna ma'am said that it should be inclusive schools, colleges. Everybody should get an opportunity. Everybody should get a shot at doing something in life. And it's school who has made me who I am today. And it's college also that's shaping me into a better person. So I'm very grateful to Manju ma'am and Nagatna ma'am for the lovely stay I had at DPS and the lovely stay I'm going to have at Ramaya. And uh, I think everybody knows that I'm also the inspiration behind DART. Yeah, right? absolutely. You and, are, uh, you, by the way, you are not, you, you, you said I am, okay. You still are the inspiration for us. Okay, yep. Every day we meet you, Amaya, Amog, and Rishi. Every time we see you, we are inspired to do our best. And when I first joined school, there were like a lot of question marks as to how will it proceed, how will it go. But then things finally settled in. It's very important to like go with the flow. Don't really have a plan in mind, but have a plan. But not so rigid. You should be flexible. 
and the one thing that really helped in school was that every time we needed some help we approached the management and told them that this is the problem we are facing this is the solution how can we implement it because in a school where you have so many children you can't expect the management to look into each and every student if you have a problem you need to approach them and it was the same story in ramaya when we came first time we had a look around there were few changes that need to be done few doors that need to be opened so we approached the principal nagratna ma'am and she said whatever you need you just let us know and we'll make sure that that's done so it's all these things that make the experience worthwhile and let's it bring out the best in you and i as you know that i've got so many awards in my schooling life i've done well in my 10th i've done well in my 12th that enabled me to get a scholarship into college and then college started again i had the same fears that i had in school but those were also taken care of by a welcoming management and then now recently i took part in a collage making competition in college and i came first and i got a trophy for that and all we have to do in life is overcome challenges like one more challenge in my life was becoming head boy when i first wanted to apply for head boy i wasn't sure i thought that you know i'm on the wheelchair i won't be able to do justice to the position then my principal manju ma'am came to me and she said is that the only reason you're not apply because you're on the wheelchair and i was like yes ma'am i'm not sure then she said you apply we'll take it from there and then when i applied i went for through inter- interviews this that and based on my own merit i became head boy and then there's a lovely team who was with me and they supported me throughout and it all just happened and at the end of it i emerged a winner so oh you did actually did i remember all the times the i could i mean we were so proud to see you in school like you said it's a lot of challenges we overcome now there's a challenge which nobody thought we could overcome and we worked on to together was multiple exam skipping you yep. are the only one in the entire world to have had a multiple exam skipping done okay you you are you even you are already unique there's nobody like you but you become part of uh, science history right yep. now so how does it feel to be that person so it feels great to be the guinea pig <laughs> to have done something first in the world yeah. not knowing what the outcome can be but life is all about taking those risks and then living by the consequences whether good or bad but uh, that's what life is about you take decisions and at the end of it things just work out on its own so how were the consequences what are the benefits i mean if there are benefits it's good things have improved day to day activities have become easier so that's a big improvement and it is easier to do everything that i could do i i can see there's a guitar hanging behind you that means you started playing the guitar more haven't you yeah is that good fish guitar also and now during that's- these Six months that I have been at home, it's given me a chance to like focus on my hobbies, like playing the guitar. Then I play also, on my, then I play on my PlayStation. Dad. Also then teaching your dad. Then I started yeah. cubing again, and uh, when I, I love sports. So when I was ambulant and able to stand on my own, I played cricket also till I could. and i have dogs in my life and i feel that everybody should have a pet in their life irrespective of whether it's a bird cat dog maybe a tiger or a lion oh. <laughs> that also is a pet is a pet basically 
I think your mom and I need to go to Banargata see if there's a tiger cub somewhere. <laughs> Thank you so much, Karan. Thank you so much. You're a true source of inspiration. Uh, and I want to conclude. Yo, go ahead. By saying that whatever you want to do in life, to all the DMD warriors out there, whatever you want to do, do it and make sure you do it till the fullest. thank you anything anything for the kids the other kids do you want what as a like you said a guinea pig there are people there are kids out there who are scared who might say is it sounds keeping how how am i going to feel uh, what will it do to me there are scared kids out there you're the only one in the world who's gone through the process i mean would you recommend the process do you think it is scary but do you think it's worth it see it's not like i was not scared the first time that i took exon skipping i was also scared deep down not knowing the consequences but then you have to weigh the benefits to the consequences and the consequences that you assume will happen you're not entirely sure that those will happen it's just an assumption so to and the benefits is something you know the consequences are something that you don't know yeah so it's you have to just it's a balance so you have to make a decision and stay with it i would recommend everybody to get this the benefits of exon skipping and have regular physiotherapy and steroids is also an important part and you have to take the correct dose of steroid it's like a car going on a highway if you go under the speed limit it's bad if you go over the speed limit that's also bad so you have to go at the correct speed limit so it's the same when it comes to dose of steroid you have to have a correct dose so these somebody are some of the things that help in managing the diseases somebody make him the ambassador for dart is anybody listening is like he's perfect <laughs> thank you so much karan thank you so so much okay yeah. i shall see you around soon thank you for being part of this uh, there are lots of people saying hi and congrats in the chat Uh, to you so you can say hi and bye to them yep, sure uh, in, in the meanwhile i like to call uh, pradeep sir if he's a gangadharan pradeep sir uh, he is also one of our earliest people who have been supporting us who he runs a chain of restaurants uh, in his home state uh, and uh, he's he's also a dmd parent and a dmd warrior uh, pradeep sir if you're there if you can switch on your video please and uh, yeah there he is another pradeep need your permission i need your permission ah yes sir i have asked you to put video okay ah. okay first of all good afternoon to everybody um i am jee pradeep we are staying in bhopal uh, one and brought up Uh, in Nepal, I am uh, basically a uh, care life, and uh, in 1965 I was born. I was working here in DHU, and uh, after my marriage, uh, we had two kids and uh, um, two sons. The elder son was okay, the younger son was also okay. There was no problem. All of a sudden, I saw that. Uh, I just want to tell you about uh, how it happened. i found out that uh, uh, he was not uh, uh, getting up from his knees and uh, yeah. walking uh, i hope everybody can hear me hello yeah, yes sir we can hear you go ahead go ahead we can hear so uh, then finally uh, since uh, uh, my father in law used to say that uh, um, my wife had a brother and he passed away a uh, few years back before our marriage and uh, uh, because of that reason uh, i started you know you had the habit of dropping the net and uh, he used to say some kind of uh, pseudo muscular dystrophy or something i said why my child is not walking and i came to know through net surfing that uh, dystrophy is a um, genetic problem and it can happen but anyway my child was not diagnosed with genetic So I thought, why not get it checked? And I went to the All India uh, Amrita Institute of Health Science in Kochi, and uh, they asked me 
this uh, small, uh, what we call a 50 rupees the blood test, what we call that, as I'm forgetting. And uh, with that, uh, the, the test came out to be in a bad condition. And then I went for the genetic test and I found out that after, uh, after one month uh, weightage, I came out that he is uh, positive. Finally, I was very depressed uh, for a week and then I consoled myself and uh, said that this is not the way to handle it. Let me enjoy my life. I mean to say I have to enjoy my family. I have only one life. Left. So, so you have to enjoy your life, keep the spirits of the family very high and uh, manage the whole thing. The whole thing is managed in such a way uh, if you are spirited and like Sartak was saying, no sympathy, only empathy. It had in my mind, and I heard it from Tata. That is the way you have to go. In my house, there is nobody with a different muscular dystrophy problem. I am playing, he is now 40. I am associated with that since last seven years. And uh, you are, you see, most of the people, they feel that they have hit a wall, but it is not like that. I was looking for a person like me who could find and i found out that uh, mr anand is the right person and i said i am with you and we will do whatever is possible and since uh, uh, you see economical strain is there and god helped me in that and uh, i went for it and uh, it is working and it is doing wonders and my child is really happy he is positive and he has got no problem and uh, i also believe and we are not sympathetic at all. We get this part of holding, that is part of love, and that is the way it is being handled. And I started with homeopathy, I wear, I have been treated also, that is part of life. You are desperate in your mind, and you just do all, all these things. And he used to be going to school, and the school was, he used to be going to the DPA, and uh, the school was 21 kilometers apart. And because of the traveling, he used to get uh, you know, very tired, and we got admitted to a school nearby. And especially in this uh, COVID era, he's, and he was not able to go to school very often. Now, in this COVID era, he was able to get along with his colleagues in the screen and enjoy the classroom. And he's doing very well in his education. And after hearing all the dignities, has uh, boosted my confidence. My wife is also very confident. And we are, you know, sailing across. And I hope it is going to help us. And uh, Deflacort, usage of Deflacort, the, the cardiotherapy by Anne Matthew. And these are the things which are really helpful. And we are enjoying the life. That is what is said to everybody. Even if you are a DMD patient, the life is a life, and you have to be part of it. And the life needs to be enjoyed and be positive. And there is a, a cure for DMD. Uh, you see, you, basically what happens when you're sick, you go to a doctor. And the doctor is a learned person. Whatever he has learned, he will tell you. But beyond doctor, there is the almighty, that is creation and uh, there is a medicine for everything it will come it will take its time and it is on its way like you can see sarsa Karnveer, everybody is there it is it is there and it is working and it is going to help and uh, the most important thing again i am saying uh, sarsa has given me that uh, line no sympathy only empathy and sympathy in house that will bring you down and the whole family atmosphere, you don't need to spoil as a, as a master of the house. You have to keep the spirits going and that disease will be defeated. I am really thankful to Anand sir and uh, Shastri sir, Bertie, especially you and the whole team. But the whole team is really uh, spirited, positive. I know the problems, the ups and downs and uh, now during the COVID period, I have also had a low time. And uh, uh, thank you, sir. Thank you everybody for giving me an opportunity to listen 
Thank you. And we will defeat. We will defeat. Definitely, we are going to be the winners. We will, Thank sir. You. We will, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. Um, I'm in uh, okay. Oh, you're in a restaurant. Okay, sir. Wish you all the best. I hope uh, now your stunts back on feet and you do very well. All the best, sir. Next, I'd like to call uh, the Karpur family. I can already see Amaya on the video. Hi, Amaya. Uh, I think we should be able to say hi. Let's ask him. Yeah, hello. Hi. How are you? I'm fine. Welcome. We, we spoke to your ma'am, Rama ma'am. She's, she's a big fan of yours, as, our, as all of us are. Thank you. Yes, what would you like to say? Uh, so, right now I'm having online classes, so I like oh, okay. it because it's a new experience. So, I'm also in ninth grade. Uh, yeah, so... Amya, I have to tell you, we love your paintings and drawings, and I know that you have a Facebook page yeah, with all your pictures. Can just share it now. Yes, we can share. Uh, we'll uh, we'll ask Dr. Arun to find it on Facebook and share it here. No, I can share it now. He wants to share a screen. Oh, excellent! Yeah, please do. We you can share a screen. Made a Facebook page. Oh yes, yes, we did, and we really enjoy the, your creative output. Well done. How do I share the screen here? Yeah. At the bottom. Of the... Is Amaya teaching you, Manish? Oh yeah, yeah. No, no. The, the kids <laughs> yeah, are uh, equipped. Yeah, they are. They are. Yeah, I'm just sharing it. Very yeah. tech savvy. You can uh, you able to see. Oh, oh, wow, Spider Man. Yeah. That is really nice. Well done. Oh, this is a new Spider Man, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, Miles Morales. Wow. He, he drew this. Uh, oh, okay. Chadwick, Chadwick Boseman. Okay, Pakanda Parva. So there you go. Yeah, yeah. Excellently done. Well done. That is so well done. We should have a museum of your artwork. Yes. You so, want to speak again? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Amaya, for sharing your work. That is so nice. It's very, very well done. Why, sir, do you have anything to say? No, no. Uh, Amaya had prepared something to share. So, uh, only, the only thing I tell is that don't look at the limitations. The limitations can bog you down. This, there are hundreds of possibilities. Just focus on the possibilities. Involve in all the activities. I'll just take a few examples. For example, when we had a Ganesh Chaturthi, Ame and Ahana together made a clay Ganapati at home. And then wow, okay. they did it very well, used wonderfully. And we use that for the puja. And, oh. uh, he, he, and he, keep, he indulges himself in these drawings, right? His, he has, his mother spoke, he's part of book, book clubs and culture clubs that keeps him active, right? So keep them active, keep them engaged in all the areas that they are capable of doing. These are wonderful kids. And look at the possibilities. Uh, uh, consult your doctors, follow on the medication and management. But um, beyond that, the social interactions, engagements, activities, keep them normal, keep them like any other child. So that's what is the point, main point. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Amaya. Yeah, so I like the online class because I can sleep longer. Before I had to get up very early. Now you're making me feel jealous. Uh, yeah. And I have a lot of pets at home. I have three kittens. I like to play with them. They're very nice. They play a lot. Oh, so sweet. And yeah, I used to play with my friends a lot before this coronavirus. And I used to enjoy with my friends a lot. They, we used to go to places and with them. Uh, many movies also. Well, hopefully soon we'll be able to do that. Yeah. Well, you Thank you, Amaya. Yes. Actually, he had written down something. I always miss start events. This time uh -huh. I'm going to miss biryani, it seems. <laughs> You know what? We missed the biryani too. I will tell Anand about that. We'll send Danzo the biryani to you. Before we go, uh, quickly, Mahesh, I just yeah. wanted to share this with everybody because this is something I really love. This is something that Mahesh wrote for us. Uh, our mission is secure. Together we will ensure Team Dart is in this for sure. Our mission is secure. Motive selfless and pure. Team Dart is in this for sure. Our mission is secure. Effort relentless, now mature. Team Dart is in this for sure. Our mission is secure. Come along, everyone. Here is a jewel. Team Dart is in this for sure.
thank you team dal that means a lot to us it made it makes us feel really as every time we head into the lab i can think of this and think of what we are doing this why we are doing this for thank you so much and you've also made the mistake of telling us that we can make it into a song so <laughs> so we are working on that uh, anand is going to be the vocalist so wonderful and we can make hitesh uh we'll sing it <laughs> absolutely and i know exactly why we're going to do that because now it's time for hitesh to talk so thank you mahesh well, and thank, thank you. you amaya say hi to ahana and aruna bye bye and and let's welcome hitesh chauhan uh, the organizing secretary of dart conference sir have i done my job properly sir all good okay sir uh hirish we can't hear you you are un- you are not muted but we still can't hear you one second let me try that again uh to everybody who's listening uh after this we directly go to dr arun shastri where he will field your questions uh hirish can you unmute yourself yes uh hold on no it's again mute ha ha no it's not uh hitesh bhai just uh quit zoom come back i will let you in and we'll do this again i will talk to darsh patel in the meanwhile okay hi darsh can we have you here darsh i'm asking uh can you just unmute yourself sorry i think ah yes i'm mute sir hi hi darsh how are you i'm very fine sir what are you doing what are you up to <laughs> i i was doing i was seeing my phone ah uh, were you are you supposed to be in class yes oh okay good good you can use this excuse and say ma'am i had i was talking in an international conference that's why i couldn't come to class it sounds good okay we will give you a certificate that you talked in the conference okay thank you how are you feeling what are you doing what are you up to nowadays today i'm very fine but i can can't go outside but i'm doing my home exercise and all that activities okay you you like doing physiotherapy yes sir you 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 know that it's very important to do physiotherapy why do you think we have to do physiotherapy because i want to work you want to yes exactly Exactly. That's why we need to do physiotherapy, and you have to do it correctly, and you have to do it continuously. You can't like you can't say after four days I am not doing for two days. I did four days only. Okay, okay I'm not saying now onwards. <laughs> no problem. How is everybody at home? All are very fine, sir. Okay. Say hi to all of them. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Dar. Thank you for joining us. Okay. I will okay. catch up with you later. Bye. Bye. Okay, and now let's see if Hitesh Bai is back. Hi, Hitesh. Are we good? Okay. So we heard some fan sound, but as soon as you stop, start talking, it stops. Uh, <laughs> some issue. Sorry about that. throughout the entire conference i managed to get everybody's audio but the organizing secretary i'm not able to help i am no i can't hear anything at all you oh arun okay i will get to arun shastri and then you go but let's say thank you well done by the way everybody out there this entire brochure was designed by our man hitesh here well done thank you so for doing amazing job thank you for trekking across half of bangalore to come and help us thank you i will call arun now okay everybody is waiting for arun shastri he is the main guy he is the main guy i will actually put him on video i will mute myself i'll switch off my video and i will go off and have water because everybody wants to talk to him so arun it's your flow thank you hitesh and arun you can take off now okay hello everyone Uh, i would like to thank uh, i think it's been a long day we were supposed to finish at 1 and we have been running 1 hour late uh, as indian standard time so 
just to tell you what treatment option is available dart has been focusing in exon skipping using oligonucleotides for the last 8 years and exon skipping can cater to almost 85% of the dmd mutations now uh, i have seen lot of uh, people have asked uh, whether their uh, kid will be eligible in this trial so it depends on what the mutation is so i'll give you an example if there is a deletion of exon 42 to 43 then they need exon 44 skipping if it is 48 to 52 they need exon 53 skipping if it is 48 to 50 then they need 51 so like that in each case the number of exon to be skipped changes now you all heard karan karanveer singh anand was the first patient in india to try the exon skipping developed by dart that's his family and that's we are all from the dart family the researchers who developed this and uh, karanveer has been on this medication for more than a year now which motivated us to take this therapy to more patients so that's why we have we had applied for the clinical trials approval and we have got it just last week we got the approval and right now there are nine centers in india which will be doing this trial so we will be soon releasing a form which will ask you details on your mutations and as i said almost 85% of the people would be eligible for this but we need to do confirm genetic testing to do it and don't worry even if you are not eligible in this trial this trial is going to happen only for a year after this the next year this will be available for the others also so i will be releasing the forms i will be emailing you i have got all your contacts so uh, please be ready and fill this the thing is it's an expensive treatment but compared to what has been approved in the us we have got the therapy in a very affordable manner compared to the us price but again it is a challenge for us right now the only way we have moved forward is that patients and families have supported this and that's how we got this therapy to a level of clinical trial currently there are not much funds available so we have to do it ourselves so dart is open for donations and we can help you raise crowdfunding campaigns so that you can help yourselves buddy yeah in case if somebody else wants to ask some questions we can unmute them Okay. Specific questions. Somebody just asked, "Where is this in Pune?" So the trial details and everything will be uh, shared officially. Right now, a lot of paperwork is pending, and because of COVID nineteen work, we are yet to get a lot of agreements from the hospitals. So right now, we know we can only share these cities are there. Whichever is so, but the form which you will be needing to fill will have the name of the cities, and you can click which city is closer to you. and the whole decision of you getting into the trial is based on the hospital and the doctor we have no role in recommending anybody for being part of this clinical trial so that is the disclaimer i am giving but yeah. this trial is going to last only for a year after this this will be a therapy which will be available for any dmd patient uh so there are a lot of questions coming out they are mostly frequently asked questions uh, we can have an faq part in the website yeah. right so what i would suggest is we have all these comments down i will i will this chat window i will say and all these comments we will answer them online on the website we can have an faq where the forms will also be available uh, arun on dart india yeah by this uh, week we will be sharing these forms and you can circulate this to all the known dmd families and patients you know our goal is to reach out to every dmd kit possible in the country and serve yeah. them with our therapy yeah and we will make sure we are we are very transparent in this we will make sure that we let you know when it's happening and where it's happening uh, unfortunately we may not be able to reach so to all of you personally but we are online so go to www.dartindia.in Or even just Google 
dystrophy annihilation research trust you will get our website and you can check it there and we will not immediately but in two or three days we will have the information out on the website so that's what and we'll also have the frequently asked questions uh, uh anything else you see uh, room that you like to talk about somebody is asking is this a lifelong treatment so the thing is that see right now in the case of duchenne muscular dystrophy the patients do not have this protein called dystrophin so as long as they are on this exon skipping therapy they get some dystrophin which is produced currently this is a treatment this is not a cure but lot of technologies are in development like gene therapy and crispr but it will take some more years for them to come for a stage of clinical trial but right now exon skipping is the only therapy available in the world which is approved by us fda and we also have got the approval from the indian fda to do this trial but we are open for any kind of mutation with any kind of dmd so please register i will be sharing the forms and all the best thank you and i think it's time we call this to a close it's 250 right now so we have been running off time uh, let me just say thank you to each and every one who stayed here uh, there have been times when there were 100 people in the list uh, the audience and there were 20 people waiting as well thank you for staying for being patient uh, thank you dr sarthak for the lovely comments that he just gave um, it has been a tough time uh, obviously even if it was not covid it's still tough doing a virtual conference but i would like to thank all the people who are involved in this uh, i would like to thank uh, Mo- movin and hitesh for being an amazing core team for putting the whole thing together the ideas and to make sure that you did everything and sent out the mails I'd like to thank kirti and deepika for sending out all the mails and making the excel sheets and making sure that all of you every single participant got the mails in details huge shout out to arun shastri for being a valuable pillar of support Uh, shout out to akila as, as well for helping out and staying back late night and of course the two people i have to thank who are responsible for all of this is the amazing father son duo of ravdeep singh anand and karanveer singh anand so thank you yeah, both of you oh. first of mm-hmm. organizing chemistry full so i finished up the organizing committee full in one but the entire anand family oh that means i should not also miss out shadow anand so yes aras anand Movin Anand, Karan Anand, and Shadow Anand, thank you so much for being doing all the things you do. Uh, thank you to the lovely team at Dart, everybody who was there. Uh, this is the second conference. We will have another conference soon enough. Hopefully, a physical conference, probably next year. Um, we will have all of this. So this. video that you're watching right now we will put it into a version that will be available on youtube and we will make it available for anyone for public viewing all you have to do is just subscribe to the dark india youtube channel and through that in a week when we upload this you'll be able to see it and you can also put the comments there uh, we have also asked all the speakers for the powerpoint presentations whoever is consenting to share them we will share it with you as well so for now thank you one and all it's been a long day please if you are in india please go and have your lunch anywhere else in the world i know professor antony is still there please go and have your breakfast uh, this is bertie ashley signing out from dystrophy analysis research trust WDAD 20 this is world vision awareness day and we have all been made aware of what are the amazing things that are coming ahead of us and why we dart are there to help you get through that so thank you one and all have a good day take care happy WDAD 20 bye